So what is the cause that we say that Ruby is easy to use and to learn? So actually the causes are first that, like it has two core values. Uh, the first value that we're used to define it by its creator, it's called Matt. Um, the first core value is that it's optimized for developer happiness. So it's really part of the like Ruby doctrine, basically. What does it mean? Uh, it means that it's trying to really simplify everything it can, uh, which means that it, manage all your it manages all your memory needs. It is fully portable, which means that if you have a code base running on whatever machine and you send it to your friend who, uh, who is running like a totally different and foreign machine, it's going to work the same. Like you can have the guarantee of this. Um, it is easy to deploy, so we'll see more about deployment when we talk about system administration with Sylvan stuff, but like, it is easy to deploy as well. It's as easy as deploying files. Um, it also feels natural. So what does it mean, natural? It means that when there are bits in the language that you would think, oh well, you know, it's a bit weird, but you know Ruby is like that, then like, you can kind of expect that uh, in the next version of Ruby it will go away. Because like, they're really trying to get rid of those things so that like, everything feels you know, normal and expectable. Um, something else, uh, the syntax is trying to be lightweight as much as possible, and we'll see in the part like, where Ruby is too easy that sometimes it goes a bit far. Like It's really trying to be so lightweight that sometimes it's trying to be too lightweight. Um, while enforcing a sense of ambiguity, so that means it's really trying to get you not to hit any keystroke that you don't need to hit, you know, like really like getting it as short as possible, but at the same time, it needs to know uh, certain things, like uh, sometimes you will need to put parentheses around stuff to really like order your code and stuff. And when it's not happy because your code is ambiguous, it will tell you, like this is not clear enough for me, please uh, clarify. Um, something really cool about Ruby, like the rest of it, you could actually compare it with Python, but this is very Ruby, like as much as it can, it will try to, be, to read like English language. We'll see more about this, but it's kind of a fun part. It doesn't mean that you write it like English, because of course it has a syntax, like you, you have to put the proper dots between the object and the function, you have to put the parentheses, like sometimes you don't even always have to. But like when you define a new function in Ruby, and when people who define Ruby define the, the core API, they thought about that. They were like, okay, if I write it in English, can I make it, like, can I make it in a way that when people use it, it will read like English language. So you'll see how, how it looks like. It's actually quite a fun part of Ruby. And remember something, which is on the bad side, it is optimized for developer happiness at the exclusion of everything else. And it's really like very strict about that, which means that if there's a way for you to do something and like that makes your life easier, but at the same time, it damages badly your performance, it will still let you do it. Right, so like it's optimized for your happiness, but there are trade-offs. Um, second principle of Ruby, the principle of least surprise, POS. And the principle of least surprise is basically that when a developer is typing something, what happens should be what he expects, or what they expect. I want to do X, I guess ideally I write it like this, it should work. Principle of least surprise. Of course, respecting the Ruby syntax, respecting what you know about Ruby and the rules, etc. Um, also something that's interesting is that it's avoiding, like really, trying really, really hard to avoid the but why would it work effect. So basically it's trying every time that you miss, you're like hitting a problem, the, the interpreter will try to be as explicit as possible with you so that you can know what the problem is. And the idea is to try to, for you to like fix your bugs as quickly as possible so that you can focus on the features basically. So of course it's not always the case. Sometimes you have like bad surprises, but overall it's really trying hard to do that job well, which is a good thing. So Ruby is really trying to get you to love it. Like really, and you'll see it when you use it that sometimes, and that's what I was referring to when I said like Ruby is too easy, sometimes it tries too hard, you know, and sometimes it feels like, you know, like the, I should have put that picture instead, you know, the over-attached girlfriend, you know that, <laughs> that internet meme, like, which is, which is like sometimes Ruby feels so much like it's trying you to get to love it, that sometimes it feels a little bit like that. So first, Ruby is easy. So from now on, I'm gonna try to be as hands-on as possible now that you know everything about Ruby. Um, so first, let's talk, why is Ruby easy? Let's talk about the boilerplate. Can somebody, like, does everybody know what boilerplate means? Okay, can somebody explain boilerplate? Okay, uh, yeah, uh, do we have microphones? Oh, um, so it's sort of like the standard welcome um, syntax of any sort of given language, I guess. Uh, can, you, can you repeat? Sorry, standard, it's a standard welcome um, 
program for any given language. Like so Hello World is the same in So yes and no. But, uh, Hello World is a good way to see a program's boilerplate, but the boilerplate is basically the minimum amount of stuff that you need to get started. Right? It's like, for instance, in HTML, the boilerplate is the HTML tag, the head tag, the, the body tag, like it's part of the boilerplate. Uh, in, uh, in JavaScript, you don't really have any, in Python either. In Go, you have to go like int, main, etc., in C as well. You know, that's the boilerplate. Uh, in Ruby, it's like Python and JavaScript, you don't really have a boilerplate, which means that uh, you can like create a file and call it like uh, hello world.rb. And actually, actually, I think it runs. Right, it runs. So you, do, you don't have anything to do. If you want to display it, display something and say hello world, like you print hello world. So it printed here, the prompt, like I didn't put any new line. Uh, in Ruby, you can add a new line, but that's, that's too much work. So because it's too much work, you have another keyword to do that, which is put part of the syntax. Right, it works. And actually, there's another way to, uh, to like run just like a simple line of code like that in Ruby. It's the interactive Ruby, which um, like we had the occasion to look at. It's called IRB. And like when you run Python in the terminal, you can type some Python. When you run just Node, you can type some JavaScript code. IRB is the same. You can type IRB and go like, it's hello world. Right. And that works. And it tells you what it returns, which is in this case, nil. Puts returns nil. Nil is like, who, who doesn't know what nil is or null in other languages? It's basically there's nothing in there, right? Um, OK, so that's the boilerplate. So now we can. We can move along, yeah. Um, what else? Variables and types. So say I want to I wanna create a variable that's called x, and I want to put the, um, the number 8 into it. Uh, ideally, how would you write that in the most simplest way? If you know, yeah, OK, x equals 8. If you know the answer because you know Ruby, please don't answer. Of course, this is all like to try to guess. Yes, easy. Now I have x. It returns 8. I'm happy. Um, I didn't need to type to like type a type because loose, uh, Ruby is a loosely typed language. That's how it's called, like JavaScript, uh, like Python, and unlike uh, Go, C, Java, and this kind of languages. If you're familiar with them, um, now x. What type is x right there? So int actually in Ruby we called it a fixed name, but it's the same thing. Um, now I want x to be a string that says hello world. How do I how do I do that? The most simplest way, the most simple way possible. No problem. So Ruby behind the sheets, will, behind the, the hood, will like make it happen. It will change whatever the type is so that what you want it to happen will happen. Um, now I want my, knowing that my first name is Rudy, and my age, <laughs> I actually don't remember. Uh, 31, I think, 1984. Uh, thir 31, because my birthday is not past. Uh, and now I want to build a sentence that goes, my name is Rudy and I'm 31. So I, I'll go, my name is, and how would I, how would I do in C here? Percentage D. Yes, uh, actually this is a string, so percentage S. <laughs> and my age is, ah, uh, percentage D. And then I'll type the, right, and in a printf. Too much work. Too much work and um, and not very readable. So Ruby, like as, our, as you remember, is really trying to be as readable as possible. So ideally, in an ideal world, I'd like to just put my variable here and for it to work. Except too ambiguous because it could be part of the string. So and Ruby, you didn't tell Ruby this is where your variable is. <coughs> and to do that, you just go this. And here Ruby is going to go like. I'm not sure if you mean this, and then I sh this is part of the text, or if you mean this, and so you oh, <laughs> nice. So you need to actually like delimit where your variable is, like this. So that's not ambiguous. That's minimal. It's clear. Right. Yes. What if we wanted to write my name is literally? Uh, so this extrapoles, extrapolates like those characters. This does not. And it's still a string, but it does not extrapolate. Another way is you can escape this. Um, so 
Uh -huh. Here, I use single quotes instead of double quotes. Just like repeating what I just said, if you got it, like, you, don't, you don't need this. Single quotes mean the string is not going to extrapolate, which means it's not going to interpret anything inside it. It's going to keep it as is. Um, so that works. And another way is I use, still use double quotes, so it will extrapolate, but I escape this character by putting a backslash in front of it to say, please don't extrapolate that sharp character, please. Both of them are possible. All right. Um, something else. How do I? How do I? What's the? It's out. Command P. Yeah. If statements. Yes. Oh my. Yes. Yes. Good call. Forgot about you guys. Sorry about that. Huh? Oh, I think it wasn't. Okay. All right. Uh, if statement. So, how would you write an if statement ideally? Like, let's say, let's say. So, remember, first name holds Rudy, and I want to check if first name is Rudy. Then I want to put or so like print on console, hello Rudy. How would I write that? Does somebody want to give it a shot? It's not really guessable, right? You need to know the syntax, but you know, let's let's try it. Who wants to give it a shot? For fun. Yeah. So I'm guessing puts and then or is that no? So only if first name is Rudy. Oh. Never mind. How would you <laughs> just try it? Just try it. So if uh first uh, actually uh no, yeah. First name equals equals. Okay. Let's let's try it. And then uh quotation marks Rudy. Okay. Oh, actually, it's asking for some more. So it looks like it detected that I'm not done with this. So uh, I'm guessing puts hello already, right? Yeah. With this just before. And then how does it know that I'm done? It doesn't, so I have to tell it. And it here. It worked. Right, that's it. Now let's say that I want to do like, if first name is not Steven, what is it? Yeah, does it work? Line. I'll come to that. I'll come to that just after this. If first name not Steven, then not Steven. <laughs> right? It works. But that's too much work. And that's not very readable. So I want to say, like if I, if, I, if I speak English, I want to say something like, unless first name equals Steven. That's terrible. <laughs> that works. <laughs> I don't like that. <laughs> you don't have to use it. And if you want it to be in a single line, there's a way to do that, which is... And that's actually really readable and very appreciated in a very long code base. Of course, this only works, like, so you put the if after the statement. This only works if there's only one execution that you need to run after the, inside the if block, right? And it works in the less too, of course. All right. All right, let's move on. Um, arrays. OK. So ideally, I want to create an array of three elements. Um, and the three elements are Daniel, Dora, and Chris, like th three strings. How would I create it, like people, people in the room? Ideally. An array? Curly braces like this? Square brackets? Yeah, the square brackets. And I'm guessing Dora, I said Chris and Daniel, right? Yeah. Easy. So if I, yeah, it is in that variable. Not, do you have a question? Yeah, the curly braces work? It's something else. They are used in the Ruby syntax. It's actually the next slide. Um, now I want to add an element to it. So I want to. I want to add. Um, I want to add. Uh, I don't. I want to add test name to it. Um, so you need to know for that. There's something you can't know by yourself. It's a syntactic bit of Ruby that adding an element to an array is this symbol, double, um, like smaller, like because you're going to put it in that at the end of it. And you don't need like to reaffect memory or whatever. You got your array. OK? It's going to manage your memory, so you don't need to care about that. Now, if you really, like, really want to do something that's not very useful, but you can, 
You want to add an integer. No problem. <laughs> Why? Why shouldn't it be? You know? But I'm guessing that usually you don't want to do that. So let's put this back this way. Um, now let's say that we have, we have external people in the room. What are your names, actually? What's your name? Camden. Uh, how do you spell it? Camden. C -A -M -E -N. Oh, OK, like London neighborhood. Okay. What's your name? Carrie. Carrie, like? Uh, C-A-R-R-I. Sorry? C-A-R-R-I. Oh, OK. Like the Stephen King book. <laughs> All right. <laughs> Not a good reference, but. <laughs> OK, now I want to I wanna make uh, uh, an array of all people in the room. So I need to take this first array here, and I need to take this second array and add them together. How would I do that? Add plus. plus. <laughs> <laughs> Why not? Yeah. Why not? I mean, you want to do it, so Ruby's going to do it. Um, what else? Oh, something else that's cool. OK, of all people here, so there's something that's called ranges. And it's like, it's really what it is. It's like a range of the array, like a subset of it. Uh, and I want to, like, so I want to get the first, how would you get, like, the, so, like, they're, they're numbered from zero, so that's zero, one, two, three, four. Uh, how would you get Chris? One, one, one. So it's like that, yes. So, like, we extracted the element that is at index one from the array. And now you want to extract the element that goes from index one to index um, to Camden. So index one, two, three. How would I do that? Three. So you go like this. That's not it. Because uh, it does like one minus three. Uh, huh? Colon. Colon, like this. That's not it. I don't think it's going to be happy. Yeah. Oh, I thought that was going to work. Like you take the first one, and then you go to the end. Right? And actually, you want it to include Camden. Just two dots, not three. <laughs> here, I typed three dots because it's excluding the element in position three. And here, I typed two dots because it includes the element at position three. You don't have to do like plus one, minus one, or whatever. It's going to just like, you just have to use the right syntax and it's going to work. <laughs> Can you explain that again? Yeah, which is the bit that you need to learn. Yeah, uh, but that's, and then you need to learn it, so that's some effort. I agree. What is it? What do you say? Uh, can you explain that again? <laughs> um, here, I'm, oh, oops. I'm taking in the array all people. I'm taking, like, the range of elements that is from item 1 to item 3 excluded. Here, I'm taking from item 1 to item 3 included. And the difference is that I put three dots here and two dots here. Okay. Did one dot do something? I don't think so. <laughs> I'd, I'd be, no, because that's, that's a float. Yeah. yeah. Oh, what? Well, it rounded up to, uh, to one because it's <laughs> like it took the float and rounded it up to an integer, a fixed num. Um, I want the, the first item. So how do I do to get the first item? Okay. Except very often, like you need the first item, not because it's at index zero, but just because it is the first one. So that's more readable to do like this. Now I want the last item. <laughs> now I want a second to last item. No. However, Rails comes with like so. Rails is a is a framework for Ruby. It comes with something that's called active support that gives more functions like this. And Rails has first, second, third, uh, fourth, and fifth, and forty-two. And that's it. Of course. Of course. Um, so how do I do to get the second to last one? How about last that minus one? one? What is it? Last minus one. So you could do that. Uh, actually, no, because then you have last, and then you remove one from an item, from a string, right? It's like this returns a string. <laughs> and you're trying to, like, uh, no. under one to, like, uh, under one. So put parentheses. So how about so you could like take take the index of the last one, like take the length and like uh, do minus one. That sounds like too much work. Of course, Ruby's not going to ask you to do this. <laughs> minus two, because you can get minus one, which is the last one, and so you get like second to last and very last, and third to last. Can you do like uh, dot last? 
Can you do dot last dot p r e v dot p r e v prev? Well, the thing is, all people dot last returns a string. Uh, it doesn't return like an iterator and uh, whatever. It returns the string that is the last element of the array. So as soon as you're done with all people dot last, you're not even in the array anymore. So you could you could implement a function that goes second to last and gets the second to last, but uh, I, I'd argue that this is more readable. This is definitely less readable than dot last, you know. But this like dot second to last or dot third to last or dot fourth to last, like you know. Right. So we're done with this. Um, we're done with arrays. Any question? All right. Hashes. Um, hashes are something that exists in most modern languages. Uh, all modern languages, I'm thinking. Uh, they have different names in most languages. Actually, I don't think there's another language that I know that calls them hashes. Uh, in Java, we call them hash tables or hash maps, depending on whether they're synchronized or not, whatever, uh, single threaded or not. Uh, in um, Go, they were called maps. Uh, in, uh, in Python, they're called dicts. Uh, in Swift, they're called dictionaries, in Objective C as well. Does anybody know what they do? Can you explain? Can you can you send a microphone? Can you throw a microphone? <laughs> um, my guess would be that it matches a um, an element, whether it's a string or maybe an integer, to another one. So from what I'm seeing here, instead of matching Rudy to the place zero in the array, mm. you match Rudy to the um, element Rigo yeah. or John to Spence, and so. If you type one in, you should be able to get the other one also if yeah. you're in the hash. You got it. So basically, an array, like it will have indexes, which are always numbers, right? And from the numbers, you extract a position in there, an element that's positioned at that number. Hashes allow you to do roughly the same thing, except they're not indexes here. They're something else. So here we use strings, but they could be, they could be whatever, you know? Um, so for instance, so how do we, how do we define hashes in Ruby, I actually said it a few minutes ago. Braces. Curly braces, and so like if I want to do like, a, um, yeah, people. So I already use people, but we don't care. We can reassign it, right? Uh, people, and uh, actually I go with the last name, and this is the character to associate. And uh, let's go with another one, Dora. You're right in front of me, so it's going to be a lot of you today, I'm guessing. Etc. Cetera, Etc. Cetera. So you have a hash. Now what can you do with that hash? You can do people rego, and you get the value that goes like that is at the index um, rego. So everybody needs to have underst understood this for me to carry on. Who hasn't understood? OK. Um, can you, do you have a way to formulate a question that I can help you understand? I don't understand what happened. Like, What's the equal and then what is that? Okay, the syntax, okay. So basically here I'm creating a variable that's called people, and I'm assigning to it a uh, like something that is a hash. This is the hash. A hash starts with a curly brace and ends with a curly brace. And this one has two elements. This one and this one. For each element, because like I'm not necessarily positioning them by index, like in an array, I need to tell the key, which is this part of it, and the value, which is this part of it. And here's the number key, n number two key. Here's the number two value. And to like get into, so now I have my hash. It's called people. Did you get that? Yeah. And so now that I have my hash, I can do a number of things with it. And a number of things is, for instance, access one of the values knowing one of the keys. Yeah. Uh, Sifan, you raise your hand as well. Are you feeling better now, or is it still unclear? Yes, but I think uh, I will need to practice. Okay. You'll need to see how it's used. Yeah. S Somebody's raising her as well, but like, oh, sorry. <laughs> uh, would you say it's just a list of associations? Yes. Ah. That's why it's called a dictionary in some other languages, because really that's what it is, right? Okay. You good? You wanted to have, ask a question or no? You good? Okay. Cool. So now we 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 know how to do how to make a hash, how to <laughs> use it. So now I want to add another thing to the hash, like for instance. I want to add, I want to, so for instance, if I try to actually access something that doesn't exist, like, I'm like, <laughs> well, uh, come on, is it that hard to write your name? Yeah. Really? Most people get it wrong? Yeah. Okay. 
try to write my name, Rudy. <laughs> oh. Oh, okay. Then I'll be impressed. Oh, my God. He got it right. Yeah. <laughs> okay, so let's do it with Daniel. Oh, nil, because there's nothing, right? Like this thing does not exist in that hash, so it returns nil. I don't have anything there. So I want to add it. I want to add the value Daniel to the key Alzugare. How do I do that in the best of worlds? Huh? Two arrows. Actually, much simpler. <laughs> Done. So now, my hash has three elements. Very simple, once you know it. Uh, OK. Now, uh, we add, so we've done that. Now I want to get all of the keys of this thing, so that, for instance, like I can use them to access everything that exists in there. How would you do that? Keys. Of course. Why should we make it more complicated? I want to get all the values. All right. Right, so you, here I'm, I'm using a string that associates to a string. We're done with hashes, right? But what I really want you to know is that here it's a string to a string, but it could be anything to anything. Like uh, I just decided for this case that it would be string matching strings, but it could be anything matching anything. Yes. Yeah, if you write people equal and you put a JSON uh, after, it doesn't work? With, with so this could be considered a JSON a little bit, right? Like it, ma it associates some keys to some values. Uh, but you need to parse it if it's JSON. And actually, it's very easy to do, but you need, your, you need the uh, JSON library. Um, once you have the JSON library loaded, you can do json.dump. I think I'm giving you the answers to the project, but whatever. <laughs> And you have your JSON string, right? So let's actually put it, whatever, you'll find, it, you'll find this very easily online. So I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to put it in a variable, right? JSON string. All right, so now I have it in my JSON string variable. And let's say that I want to put this thing back into what I have. And well, you kind of guessed it. All right. So like going from JSON to a hash is very easy. Uh, if we compare to Go, because like so, sorry for the for the the external people, like you might not have uh, been part of the Discover Go um, workshop, but if you want a, a point of comparison with it, with it, Go enforces the syntax of the JSON, right? You have to create a struct that matches exactly the keys that are here. Ruby doesn't give a damn, right? Like it, it takes what you give it and it transforms it, right? Yes. Uh, so I, I'm just, this is a quick question about like why it's called a hash. I mean, I understand dictionary, uh, dict, but uh, uh, that's a pretty technical question. Uh, yeah, uh, maybe we don't have to. I'll go really quickly through it because it it's not what really matters here. But basically, it's a question of optimization of performance of this kind of stuff. They're called hash tables uh, because the string is hashed, uh, the key is hashed. Um, which doesn't have to be a string. Uh, what does hashed mean? Does anybody know? If you don't understand this bit, it doesn't matter. Uh, but basically, hashed means that you're taking something and you're transforming into a very short string that will identify it almost uniquely. So basically, in my, uh, in my thing, in my hash over there, when it looked at Rigo, before storing it in the people hash, it took Rigo and it found a very short string, like whichever, like uh, ABC, whatever, uh, that matches it and that is like almost unique. And what it did is that instead of storing this as a key, it stored this and like stored this apart to know that it matches. Why? Because it's not actually almost unique. It's actually not that unique. There will be, for instance, like maybe 30 of them in a given hash. So if you have a hash that's like 5,000 uh, items large, it will be much faster to find one of them if they've been hashed before and categorized like that. And that's why it's called a hash table. Um, I think you'll probably see that in lower level programming because I think C doesn't have hashes or something that looks like it. So you need to implement it in C. You need to create it. You need to hash the stuff. You need to put it in there. So you'll probably do it. Uh, in lower level programming. If you didn't get that bit, it doesn't matter. It's cool. You'll get it in lower level programming when it's time. Yes. So um, microphone. 
It's like that. It's like it's like when your computer is indexing, like yes. for Spotlight. Right. It's an indexation technique. Yes. <coughs> Just to be faster to get stuff. Yeah. All right. All right. Back to the fun. Anybody has a question? No, you're good. Okay. All right, we're done with hashes. So something else that is kind of fun with Ruby is that, oh, no, before we move to that, the th a part that's kind of interesting is that a hash can be anything, right? It can have strings to strings, or like it can match a string to a hash, or it can another hash. So it can match also a string to an array, an array to whatever. So here, like, like we were saying before, you can actually kind of get something that's familiar, that looks like JSON. Um, people who are from the outside, are you familiar with JSON? It's a way to format data, right? And here, it's basically what it's like, right? Like you have a hash that has a string that matches an int, which is the ID of the whatever thing you're getting, uh, a name that matches, like there's a string that matches a string, then a string that matches an array, which is an array of hashes, etc., etc. And once you have that, since you know how to access the first item of an array, you know how to access the ID item of that hash, etc., etc. It's very easy to like use that uh, that structure to get into that data that you want. Uh, we'll see how to iterate through those things, yeah, because like there's a little bit, <coughs> a little bit that I want to tell you before we do that. But it's also very easy to do to write, and very short. So we'll look at it. Everybody's okay with this? Okay. Everything is objects in Ruby. It's one of the things that is very different with like basically any other uh, language. And that includes Python, even though they're very similar. This is one of the, of the big differences with Python. Um, so first I want to require something that is active support. It's a library. And it comes with like a bunch of um, other uh, other functions that I can call on like the basic uh, the basic parts of the API like strings and this kind of stuff uh, So the library which is part of Ruby which is not part of active support for knowing the time is called time with a capital T big surprise How would you call how would you like use time to know the date of right now? now. So time dot now yes, okay so now I have the date of right now. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to put it in a variable, right? It's there. So now it doesn't move anymore because I captured it when it was 53 seconds. So now it's captured in that variable. Um, how do I do to take now and use it to know the date of two days ago? No. So now? Minus two. Minus two. So it's going to probably just remove two seconds because the... I, the a unit in two in now is um, the seconds. Now minus days dot Time dot days. Time dot days. Oh god, that's too much work. <laughs> you can add functions to numbers because they are an object. Nice. A number is an object, so you can add any function. So you want to transform that number into the same thing, but in days, just two dot days. Time. So like. Overall, if I like rewrite it entirely, time dot now, I want to know. Ah, I want to know what the date was two days ago. I get this, right? Still too much work, actually. Two days, yeah. Both are, are both work because one dot day, of course, is useful. Um, too, still too much work. <laughs> Why not? You can do anything. Anything is object. You can add functions to whatever. Okay, um, so that was an interesting bit. Strings, okay. Um, hello? I want to put that in uppercase. Uppercase, uppercase. because uppercase, it's the action, right? I take this, I upcase it. Um, and I want to take it, and I want to downcase it back. Downcase. Right, that was easy. Um, that's part of Ruby. That's not part of active support. It's even if you don't use active support, you have it. However, I'll show you something cool, which is I have a dog, and I want several. How would I, like, how would I pluralize it? I can do that, but oh well, that's too much work. 
That's more work. <laughs> of course it is. So that's more work. That's more work. Cactus? What do you think this will do? Mice. <laughs> Why not? Why not? You know? Does it work in French? Is it work in French? Yeah. No. It only works in English. Oh, actually, no, the, the, there are libraries. This is active support. It's not part of Ruby. Uh, there are libraries that make this work in various languages. What's active support? Huh? So active support is the name of a library that I loaded right there just before I started to do that. Uh, it's a library that brings this kind of goodies. It is not part of raw Ruby without active support. Yeah. Everybody is okay with this? Yes. Can you do cactus? Oh, yeah. <laughs> it's probably going to get it right, man. Like Campus? Oops. Campus? I'm going to break this thing. I think, uh, yeah, camp cactus is, and plural is actually still valid. So it's going to choose one, you know? Oh, I thought it was cacti. Oh. <laughs> fungus? Like fungus? <laughs> <laughs> is that good? <laughs> it's fun guy. You like that? Oh, okay. Because he's a fun guy. <laughs> Out. Uh, so if you like, if you're in your application and you want to change the behavior of some plurals, you can actually overload this so that pluralize still works, and uh, with the uh, special names that you have, it should work with everything though. It's really annoying and frustrating that it doesn't. It shouldn't be the case. Um, Okay, and I think it's one last bit of Ruby is easy. Functions. Okay, everybody is familiar with functions. I think everybody at, uh, from the students are. Are you guys familiar with what functions are? Yeah, okay, you're familiar as well. What's your name, actually? I didn't ask you before. Oh. Me? Yeah. Vishal. Vishal, nice to meet you. Welcome to Alberton School. Um, so functions, how would, you, how would you write functions ideally? I want to write a sum with like two variables, A and B, and I want to return something that's the sum of them. Uh, the keyword for functions in Ruby is the same as in Python. It's def. I'm defining a function. Uh, then how should I do it so that it's like the most you know, expectable as possible? Well, I probably should give the name of the function first. And parenthesis, a, b. And then how would I do it? I want to return a plus b. And I'm done, but it looks like IRB doesn't know it, so yeah. So that's a function, okay? Uh, actually, I put it there. It's the same one, right? If I run this thing, I'm going to go back to the code. It displays five because it defines a function sum, it returns this, sum, puts the return, that's five. Everybody's fine with that code? Okay. This is too much work. <laughs> this is too much work. Well, I'll get back to it after I'm guessing. Oh, will I? Actually, actually, we're done with functions, but because Ruby is too easy, and sometimes like it's really trying to make it so easy, let's look at this function again and consider that it's too much work. What could I remove there that's not needed? Like. Above this line, right? Because like this is just using this stuff. Remove a comma b. A comma b. Oh, find So you need to name your variables, or else like you're not going to be able to use them. And you to huh? The return is not needed. It's not. Ruby can just guess that the last line is the thing you want to return. Everything returns something in Ruby. Everything. So. The last line of your function is going to be the return statement. So return is not needed. There's something else that's not needed here. Yes? The whole function. Why? Maybe Ruby has some already. Oh, it could. Let's say that it doesn't. Yeah. Can you just do the A plus B in the declaration? In the what? In the uh, parameters. Oh, that, that would be cool. No. Uh -huh. <laughs> I mean, you could, you could do something shorter like that. And that will still work, but that's not very readable. The parentheses are definitely not needed. I still understand what that is. 
Uh, it's probably better to write it like this, so it's more readable. But yeah, so you can do all of that like that. And actually, same thing here. It's not ambiguous. Most of the times when you think that this is not as readable as it could be because like the function, the name of the function is pretty short like here, people will leave them because like it's more readable to have them. But you know that it's not needed. You can do without. And sometimes when this could read like an English for a sentence, getting rid of the parenthesis can feel more readable. So people will use it that way. But Ruby is too easy. I told you that. Um, another one. Some and differences. So here, I want to return two things. Remember how in uh, Go, we had like the ability to return two return statements? Here, we can do the same, except like Ruby is trying to reuse something you already know. So what it's going to do is that it's going to return an array of the thing that you're trying to return. And, uh, and the lesson here, I'm not going to touch the code. I think, it's, I think it's fine the way it is. But the lesson here is that you don't need to pass it to an array first and then put it in, you know, like if I wanted to do it, like if I wanted to do it in a way more verbose way, I could like take this and put this into, into a, uh, a variable and go like sum equals sd0 and diff equals sd1, right? Like I'm taking this returns an array, sum and difference returns an array that I put there. I take the first item of it, I put it in the sum variable. I take the second item of it, I put it in the diff variable. That's a lot of work. And uh, this is much shorter and just as readable. Like I'm, I'm returning an array of two elements. I just want to affect them right away. Please don't make me do all of this. Right, so this exists. This is possible. Um, that's about it for now. Because there's something worse, but I'll show it to you in the hard bits, because you need to know something first. OK, anyone has questions about this? Yes, can you, can you get a microphone? We have remote students and they yeah. here in London. Gotcha. Hello. Yeah. Uh, does, that have a, does that concept have a name for it? I think it does. I don't remember. Uh, I don't remember. I guess it's like uh, something affectation, like uh, plural affectation. I don't know. OK, cool. Probably does. <laughs> yes. Yeah. You say that in Ruby, everything is object and it's unique, but in JavaScript, it's uh, or the same case? Uh, numbers are not objects in JavaScript. Oh, OK. Yeah. Nil is not, null in JavaScript is not an object. OK. It's, it's in Ruby, term. null is an object. Okay. Like you can go, so IRB, you can go like nil, or are you nil? And that's a function on the object that returns true or false, whether something is nil or not. And if I go like, hello, are you nil? No. Is it only, uh, it, um, it's unique. There is no other. Uh, There's know. nothing except functions, which are not objects. But it's a unique um, language. That uh, the only one I know of. So I, I'm guessing like of the ones that are like yeah. popular. You know, like if I compare it with um, uh, Java, JavaScript, or Python, Go, uh, C, um, C sharp, uh, all those things, PHP. Like all of them, that's not the case. And like Ruby takes it a little bit far. So, and like the people who like uh, talk about the weaknesses of Ruby, like sometimes talk about that one, because it's like it's really taking it a little bit too far. Yeah, because w why is it useful for numbers? W what kind of function you can uh, apply? Yeah, okay. Yeah. 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 So it's not going to work because I didn't, yeah. I didn't add the uh, library that does it. Now it's going to work. So yeah, like it, it's just a readability thing. Two dot plus three, right? Two dot, you, oh, like, or two uh, like this? dot add three? Uh, I don't think it exists, but I mean, like, nothing forbids you to write it. Uh, you could actually do that. Uh, uh, okay. I'll get back to it. <laughs> actually, let's get back to it now. <laughs> let's get back to it now, because that's the next slide. Uh, so everything that's not 100% necessary is optional. We saw that in the function. You can extend absolutely anything. That means that. Like any like type that exists already, you can add new functions to it. So for instance, if you want to do a function that takes something like uh, Rudy and that returns hello instead, it doesn't exist, obviously. But you could create it and go like, OK, so in the class string, I want to create a function that's called return hello instead. 
and I want it to return hello and just do that, uh, how would I write this? Hello. Just hello. I don't need to write return in Ruby. Right. So now if I run that thing again, it returns hello instead. So everything there and even the numbers, you can actually add some stuff to it. And for instance, if I want to do like, so I'm guessing like you know what this will do, right? Like it's going to concatenate them together. But the problem is those are words and I would like to have like a new operator here that like adds, oh damn, it doesn't exist. That adds a blank space between them, whatever. Why not? You know, like I need it. I'm going to use it a lot. I really would like to have this thing. So let's take the string class again. And the way it works is that basically, actually let's cancel this. The way it works is that it's going to change this thing into like this. So it's going to apply a function that's called slash on the string and take it one parameter on it. And that's going to be exactly the same thing. Like that's how it's going to define it. So of course it's not going to work. We haven't defined it yet, but like, let's do it. So the function is called slash, right? It takes one parameter. Uh, let's call it S because it's a string. And what is it going to do? Concatenate. So it's going to concatenate three things, like the string that I'm applying this to, uh, blank space, and the parameter s. So the string that I'm applying this to, like the object, is called, it's exactly like this in other languages, but it's called self in Ruby. Oh. Yeah, but it's exactly the same thing. And then I'm going to concatenate this, like the, the blank space, and then I'm going to concatenate strings. OK, I ended the function, I ended the class. Now I can run this, it works, and I can run that. So the lesson here is you can override everything. Uh, I tried. Uh, Ruby doesn't let you override the plus for strings, for instance. Like it's trying to a little bit at least control that you don't screw things up. Um, but basically, you can like override many, many things and create new operators very, very easily. And that's why Ruby is a little bit too easy, because sometimes like, you can do some pretty ugly stuff like that. This is called monkey patching. So you monkey patch the, the object, uh, the class string. Anyway, anybody has questions about that? What did it do before? Nothing, right? Nothing. It didn't exist. It didn't exist. It was invalid. Why did you have to define the class string? Uh, I didn't define it. Uh. I, I just put the function in like, a, a, uh, like a, a space of code that was about the class string, basically. So I had to tell it, oh, by the way, in the class string, okay. there's this function too. Okay. Um, it's not actually very rare. You can do that in C++. Like reopen an object that already exists, a class that already exists, and add some stuff to it later. You can also do that in Go. When you have a struct, it's not an object, but it's like similar. You can add methods to it after you've defined it. You can't do that, like in, I don't think you can do that in Python, right? Uh, who knows Python well? You know Python well, no? Nope. No, okay. It's Josh. Uh, can, uh, can you show okay. again? Oh, sorry, okay. <laughs> can you show again the, the, the code? Sure. Oh, damn. Uh, so that, that bit, right? Oh, actually, it's going to be faster to do it like this. So what happens if you put it in a different class than string? Does it get confused? No, it's going to create another class of the name that you give it. Well, so it's like not going to define it on the strings. So if you put it like in a class, like class fix num yeah. or something like that? So I don't think it's going to let me redefine this on fix num, because that's division. Uh, but if I go like def what other character makes sense? Will this work? I've never tried this before, so we're gonna have to we're gonna have to try it. So it doesn't have. Oh, actually, it has a problem because it's trying to concatenate a number with a string, and it doesn't know what this is yet. But it's trying to concatenate two things that, like, it's trying to plus. Actually, not even concatenate because it detected that this is a number. So it's an addition for him. It knows it's like you're trying to add stuff. And you pass it a string, and it's like, oh, whoa, 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 what the hell? So you want to do it in the class that you're trying to? Well, something you can do, though, and I think you can do it, is something that's valid. 
like this. Hmm. So I'm guessing you come to find this. What is it? What if you did dot string for self? So it converts that into string. Oh, nice one. Nice. I'm guessing like it, it doesn't want me to redefine the, um, this character. But, uh, but yes, that's actually pretty relevant uh, to string, to s, to transform it into a string. Uh, and then you could like have this. Right, so let's define it as something else. I don't know of an operator that's not used in uh, there be like this. Probably has a meaning, like it's like pointer stuff. Uh, oh well. And then, like, you can go like uh, so. It's a number, so two dot hello, hello. Oh, I don't know. I don't know. <laughs> okay. Put it in the class uppercase <laughs> fix uppercase num, and it's no. It's really like it's really the class that it is. Oh, thank you. Thank you. Actually, maybe this will work. Uh, but at least I got, like you got probably the bug that it was. Uh, right, and so now I can probably do that. Right. Yeah, thanks. Oh. Typo, yes. Is, is it easy to figure out any monkey patch stuff? On no. It's not. If you're using a function, it's very hard to figure out which, what created it. Yeah. Uh, what you can do, though, is debug. Uh, you can, so, like, never debug together, but basically what you can do is, like, stuff like that, where you go, like, uh, um, quite a by bug. It's the name of a, of a, um, uh, a library. And I'm going to call by bug here. And that's the sum and difference. Right. And so now I have a debugger. Uh, a debugger is something that will take you step by step through your code to see which line of code is being executed one by one. So here it's stopped at my by bug, because that's how I call the debugger. And uh, it's telling me, OK, now I'm on that line over there. And I'm trying to get that to run. And I'm going like, OK, next step now. OK, now I'm done with this. And so now I'm trying to get this thing to run. It's like, oh, OK, next step, et cetera, et cetera. So it's like a debugger is something that goes step by step through your code. Uh, this exists for like, all modern languages. Like, you have one in your browser for JavaScript. Yeah. Uh, yes. OK, um, hopefully this doesn't take too long. But so if you can define a, well, if you can extend any class, like what? guides which class you want to add your function to? Like, how do you pick which class to add? Uh, usually you want to really do that in rare cases. Like here my point was to show you that you can do, you can do very bad stuff. Uh, usually if you want to define your own class, define your own class. Like try to like stay away from monkey patching as much as you can and define your own class with the name you want. Okay. Yeah. That makes sense. You had a question? Uh, could, does somebody have a microphone? I just want to no, if there are any other debuggers which have more features other than by bug? Probably, but I think by bug is the leader by far. Okay. Uh, but yeah, probably. I mean, like this one is come in line. I'm sure you have debuggers in your IDE, uh, but that depends on your IDE. Okay. Uh, it's probably working in it, so like at the exclusion of any other IDE. Uh, but like, uh, yeah, there's like this definitely, like probably a lot of them. The thing with by bug is you have. Um, how do you get the help again? I don't remember, but like you Can have like give tons you of a stack trace of uh, the methods. Uh, so if there's if there's an issue, you definitely get a, start, a stack trace in Ruby. Okay. Uh, so you don't really need back by bug to get that. Uh, but yeah, like for instance, okay, that's not very that's not very clean. But you can always go, okay, please raise an error. Boom, you have your stack trace. Well, here it's like one file because like we're running one file. But you would have all of the files that like it goes through 
when it raises that error. So I don't know if you talked about what ID should you would be using Ruby. Ru so like the thing with Ruby is that uh, it doesn't compile, right? So except if you use JRuby, but that's another topic. But basically, it's meant to be used interpreted. So uh, so you won't need all of the, uh, or you won't need because it's not part of it, the, uh, the uh, features that come with the compiler, like comp compile, check, and this kind of stuff. Uh, so like usually people that do Ruby use like very simple IDs. Uh, I use Atom now. Two weeks ago, I was using Sublime Text. Um, I moved to it because Go has like a better support in, in uh, Atom, and I don't like to switch from one to the other. Uh, but like, yeah, basically any will do. And I remember that at the very beginning of Ruby, like when Ruby became like very, like B Ruby became like very popular very quickly. Um, and I think the only other language that became popular as quickly was Swift recently. But like it, it had like, a, its popularity like grew like that. And because of that reason, the people who like criticized Ruby before it was a big thing, uh, said the lack of IDE is a thing, like it's a problem. And if no one fixes this thing, Ruby will go nowhere. And it turns out it was never fixed. Like you have IDEs that try to bring features around Ruby, but usually they're more superfluous than anything, like that you don't really need them. So now like Ruby developers usually use very simple ones. Like you wouldn't do Java without a strong IDE because you need to generate a lot of code, right? Like it's very verbose. But here you don't need to generate a lot of code. It's like the most, it's like the shortest possible. So yeah. And so like Adam comes with, and like Sublime is the same, comes with like, a, well, syntactic coloring, of course. You can use Vim too. I mean, like it has syntactic coloring in Ruby. Um, like, oh, uh, my bad. You know, like it colors stuff. Uh, and I wouldn't use Vim if I have a choice, because like I have a UI, so why would I use? But like you have options which help you with that. Uh, you have auto-completion here. If I want to use like some differences, it exists there, you know, because it finds it in my file. Uh, so it's not as smart as a compile language would be, as of like auto-completion and this kind of stuff, because the compile language will know, I'm applying this to that type, so it only applies to that type, so I know which one you're trying to get. Here it can't know. It's all interpreted at runtime. But still you get, like, with the basic stuff, you can get very far. Yeah, sure. Yeah, just to be clear, uh, a monkey patch is just when you add a um, a function to a um, standard library class. Uh, it's like when you add a function to, s or, or to add something to something that already exists and that you didn't write yourself. Okay. Like if you create your own class yeah. and it's called like, it's called um, customers because like this, you're gonna handle customers and uh, you like whatever, whatever, that's not monkey patching, you're defining, you're writing code, you know? But when you're like creating a new function on string or on fixnum or on this kind of stuff, yeah. uh, that's monkey patching. Okay. Yeah. yeah. And you read everywhere like, monkey patch as little as possible because then you don't know like where the code that you're running is really so if you have to you have to but um, yeah yes can you explain again uh, what situations you need to monkey patch in uh for instance there is one monkey patch in the intranet in the hobbiton school intranet on string uh because oh well, i'll just explain because it's going to be like two like, whatever. Uh, we, uh, in the, in the, um, the uh, projects, we wanted to do a, a simple way of writing like blocks of code. And we didn't want to have to type all the HTML for that every time. Like, uh, uh, you know, to code to, uh, tag, uh, to closing the, the code tag, that's a, lot, that's a lot of work. So I wrote a function that takes like a, a specific character, which is actually this one. Uh, and like when I write some code in there, it recognizes it as code, uh, and I apply it to a string, and it replaces them with the code tags. And I could have done that in like a whatever other object, you know, like go like a, so I would write like, you know, like I would uh, I would call Rudy Utils, okay, like you know my stuff, you know dot uh, uh, expand if I wanted to call that expand and it takes a string and then it returns what I wanted. But this is a lot of work, and so like I wanted to just do like s dot I think I called it content format like that. And it transforms all the stuff that I needed to transform. So I monkey patched that for my need in the internet. Uh, that's disputable. <laughs> but it makes the template so much shorter. So, yeah. Yes? You have a mic? Who has a mic? Yeah. What if we got like a hanging mic? 
<laughs> on my left. No, I'm sorry. <laughs> We've already got the hooks from the plants. So why not? <laughs> but on the other hand, like in like some projects, sometimes there are some people who still like right now. Every, no, nobody's working, but uh, sometimes there's noise coming from there. I'm not sure it will be as directional. Worth investigating, though. Yeah, well, yeah, we'll get one. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> investigating. <laughs> investigating. <laughs> <laughs> yes. What, what did you? Um, what did it do before? You before your monkey patch it. What? Content did format didn't exist. I created it. I checked that it didn't exist because I didn't want to monkey patch something that existed in case I needed it later. Right, okay. Yes. Okay. Okay, cool. Um, so, extend anything. So, if you didn't, like, if you don't remember the syntax for monkey patching something, it doesn't matter. Uh, you won't have to do it too often. But my point here was see, we can do a lot of, like, advanced and risky stuff. Uh, Something really cool about Ruby, but it's like that makes it way too easy, is that it's very easy to change version. Uh, so right now, the latest is 2.3.0, I think, which was released last week. It, it, they get released really quickly, so like they like there's a lot of contribution on the Ruby project. Uh, but it's very easy to go from one version to the other, and I can tell you, I can't tell you from memory which ones, but I can tell you that the hobbitsonschool.com website, which is built with Rails, and the Hobbiton School intranet are built with different versions of Ruby, uh, which were the latest at the time when I started them, and I don't think I upgraded them later. But, uh, but it's very easy to have several projects with several versions. How does it work? Thanks for asking. Um, oh, and of course it is portable and reverse compatible. Portable because if I take my code, I send it to Steven, and he's using Ubuntu, and I'm using Mac, it's going to work the same. And I know that there's no, ne never going to be a difference. It's one of the interests of like, using a higher level language. And reverse compatible, which is something that I think is pretty unique to Ruby, or almost. JavaScript is the same, is that if I take, uh, if I take my code written in Ruby 1.9, which is pretty old, it's like four years old, five years old, and I give it to, Ruby, to, to Steven, and Steven runs it with like Ruby 2.3, the latest, it will work. Because like, the, the um, language gets richer over time, but it keeps the memory of how it worked before so that it ensures that everything works well. Right. However, sometimes I want to use the latest features, and I want it to work seamlessly, and, uh, and I want to be able to you know, change version very easily. So there's a tool that exists that's called RVM. And RVM is about like, running all of my rubies, so like the versions of Ruby, on a VM. Like, it's very easy to use so that I can switch version like totally transparently. So for instance, right now on my computer, there are four versions of Ruby installed. Um, I don't remember why. Two of them are probably like the two versions of halbertsonschool.com and the internet. Two of them, I needed them for something else, uh, but they're here. Uh, installing, so no, let's first check what I can install. So there's loads of stuff I can install, and this is a very short list. I can actually install like tons more, but these are the most used. So like there are like thousands. So uh, it's given me like the most uh, the most used. Uh, this here, like Rubinius, JRuby, and this kind of stuff, are names of Ruby implementations. So Ruby is actually not really a language per se. It's a specification. So you can go out there and write your own Ruby interpreter with whatever tool you want. So the most used is MRI. Uh, MRI Rubies is here. Uh, that's the one that is like mostly used for every need because it has like mostly uh, upsides and like not many downsides. Um, the version that you have natively on Mac, because when you install Mac, Ruby is on it, uh, is actually an, a transformed version of MRI because it's, it's called Apple Ruby, I think, or something like that. But it's like something like MRI, just a little bit different. Uh, but you can install other ones, and they all have a different thing. For instance, you have Go Ruby. Go Ruby is a version of Ruby written in Go. Mm -hmm. Why not? So if you want to contribute to a Go project and you know Ruby well, it could be like a cool thing. Um, JRuby is very used in production uh, because it actually compiles. So it makes Ruby as like no, I, I'm not. It doesn't make Ruby as fast as low level languages because like there's so much fancy stuff in Ruby that does things you know to make your life better. Uh, like it's going to go and around and do some useless stuff. But when it runs, it's already compiled, so it doesn't need to interpret the code before running it. It's already ready to be running. It's running on top of Java, which is why it's called JRuby. 
And we'll get back to it another time, but Java is JIT compiled, just in time compiled. But like when it's used, so it's portable, but when it's used on the production machine, it is used in machine language. So it's still compiled. We'll talk about compilation types another time. But basically here you can change really easily between all the rubies that I have. If I wanted to install a new one, I would go RVM install 2.3.0. I'm not going to do it because it takes some time. So I'm not going to run it now. And if I want to, if I want to change, you know, 2.2.3.4. All right, now I'm using Ruby 2.2.4. Yeah, so it's really very easy to use, and uh, it's cool so that like you can get all the latest features very easily. And truthfully, like uh, an application that is decently maintained usually is on one of the latest because it's so easy, you know. Okay, so too easy. Now, Ruby is easy even when it's hard. Why am I saying this? Because there are some features in Ruby that are not unique to the language, but almost, like not usual. Uh, and they're definitely stuff that you haven't necessarily seen at all in other languages. But you'll see that when they exist, and like it does take time to understand them, you'll see that they solve something else that is actually harder than the thing that, 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 that the thing you have to learn to use them. Uh, there are two here, so we're not, we're not gonna have a lot of them. Uh, but it's very important to understand them because they are really part of the power of the language. The first one is symbols. Can somebody tell what symbols is or guess? Yeah, guess first, somebody who doesn't know. Okay, does anybody know what symbols are? Yeah? So it's like oh, I think it doesn't work. So it's like, uh, say you have like um, a string, but you don't really need to it to be interpreted that much or whatever. You just need to represent something with a string. You can just use a symbol yeah. instead. Absolutely true. So basically, l let's say that, so I'm going back to IRB. Let's say that I want to create a list of the languages that you'll be able to use for the, your upcoming main project. Uh, there are six, so there, there was Ruby, of course, there was Python, of course, uh, Go, um, PHP, oh, oh, actually, I'm doing it the wrong, like, the way that I wanted to show you. Ah, yeah, I can create strings. Forget about what I just wrote. Sorry about that. Um, go, and let's, okay, let's limit to those. Okay, I created an array of three strings. Right. The thing is, those strings over there, I'm going to use them in various ways in my code, but I'm never going to like concatenate them with something. I'm never going to like measure their length. I'm, I'm just going to use them as keys of stuff, you know, like as a little uh, space that will allow me to identify some stuff in my code. So it's very expensive to store strings as of like performance. Uh, there, as you as you know, if you've like followed the uh, lower level um, track well, uh, there are pointers to arrays. Uh, so it costs a lot of memory to have a string. Um, if you don't know what pointers and arrays are, um, it doesn't matter, but just know that they cost a lot of things. So instead of having this, I'm going to not store them as strings. I'm going to store them as something that is much smaller, uh, it actually um, an integer in the, in the memory. So like much, much smaller than a string. And it's just going, going to be written with a column in front of it like that. And it's really the same thing as long as you don't want to like concatenate them or do some fancy string stuff with them. So that, that's a like, does everybody get that? Okay, yeah? Is that the same as define in C when you have an uppercase? Yes, yeah, yeah, in a lot okay. of ways, yes. Except it doesn't store things the same way at all, but you don't care about that when you use oh. it, so yes. <coughs> okay. Here, yeah, there's like a dictionary somewhere uh, sorry for using the word dictionary, which identifies with Python. It's something else. It's the hashes. But here, there's like kind of like a little bit dic like a lexicon? dictionary space. A lexicon. Thank you. Somewhere in the memory that like keeps track of like this symbol is equals that integer, so that you can do like you can do something like okay, well the language I chose is Python, and then later you can go like oh by the way is my lang equals equals Python, and here you're comparing two integers. So it's much faster than comparing two strings. Yes? If you write my language, it will with the string. It's not going to work. It's not the same thing. It's not the same thing. However, you can transform a string to a symbol. But uh, 
Uh, but that's not what you wanted to do here. Yeah. OK. OK, so what are, what are symbols useful for? Um, actually, one cool way they can work is that you can go, uh, let's go like back to our people stuff. Remember our hash that we had? Um, I want to, instead of going like uh, rego Rudy, this I will use a lot as a key, right? This is something that will like drag along in my memory a lot because I need this thing identifies something that's not really a string. I'm never gonna uh, uh, get it to anything, whatever. It's an index, right? So instead of using a string, uh, it's gonna be way cheaper to use a symbol. I'm not gonna change it. Very often in your need, you will need to concatenate values. Sometimes you don't. If you don't, you can make it a symbol too, you know? Uh, so here I have a hash that's written like that. And the fun thing about it is that this is too much work. <laughs> so because this is too much work, I can actually write it like this. And it's the same thing. This is part of Ruby 2. So on Ruby 1.9, for instance, which is still used, like it's five years old, but you can still find it in the wild. This doesn't work uh, in the wild. Running in the... In the yeah. vagrant. In the vagrant, yeah, in vagrant <laughs> it's 1.9. But install RVM to change versions on vagrant. That way you don't have to care about which one you install. Um, anyway, so you can find this, and you find it very often. And then you can get to like pretty complex, um, complex structures like this one. OK, so the, the thing that you're looking at is this thing. Um, so in this thing here, can somebody take a mic? I'm going to have a, ask a few questions. Feels comfortable with that? What's happening? Take a mic. Uh, can, who can tell me how many? Who can tell me the type of this first? Who wants to take the mic? Yeah? It's an array. It is an array. It starts with uh, square brace. Do we call them squ square braces? Square brackets. Square brackets, thank you. Ends with a square bracket. That's an array, very obviously. <coughs> However, how many elements does it have? That's a little bit harder to read. Three, absolutely. It has a first hash that ends, oh. Sorry. A first hash that ends here. OK? A second hash that ends here. And a third hash that ends here. Can somebody, now that you know that, can somebody read me, like in English language, kind of, uh, what, the, like, the, this structure? Like it's an array of uh, and what? Yeah. So it's an array of um, people and their pets. Yeah. And so uh, first. Uh, person is Rudy who has a cat and a dog. Second person is John who and has. And what's a the type of what's in the pets thing? Oh, uh, so pets is a um, <coughs> is just a symbol for uh, okay a array that has yeah. two strings in them. Right. So pets is the symbol that reads pets, and this is an array. So the value of this symbol in the people and pets hash is an array of strings. Yeah. Okay. Is everybody comfortable with that? Okay. So now that we have that data, it looks pretty good. We're going to want to manipulate it and access it in some way, right? I want to list the names of all the people who have at least two animals. I want to list the number of animals, the total number of animals. I want to list whatever, whatever, right? So let's try to do that. But before we do that, there's something I want to introduce you to. And that's the other hard thing that solves. Oh, no, I don't want you to print. Yes, I want you to do that. That solves something. It's called blocks. To understand blocks, I'm going to introduce you to something. I'm going to introduce you to a function. Uh, and I'm going to, how did I, how did I do it here? Oh, whatever. Uh, hello, welcome to Hobbiton School. And let's say that I want to replace all of the lowercase e with uppercase e. So the way you do that is actually you use a function that's called gsub, global substitution. And you do that. And you do that. Very easy. OK? I call G sub on a string to replace lowercase with uppercase. OK, now getting it to something more complicated that will need blocks. I want to replace this so that each lowercase e has parentheses around them. How would I do that? Like, 
This. And then, well, E. You can't put E inside? Oh, OK. <laughs> yes, it works. Uh, <laughs> right, that's smart. Uh, I didn't think about it. Okay. Think of another one where we can uh, do that. Let's have another one, which is for every, so this is a regular expression. It's going to match every lowercase character. So for every lowercase character, I want to print that lowercase character between parentheses. So you need to know what the character is before you do it, right? Or else you get, oh, what an idiot. Sorry. Or else you get that. We. Right? That's not. We. She. 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 So you need to know what it is. So here, you don't need a value to pass to that, uh, to that function. You need to pass, basically, self. OK, let's try that. <laughs> it won't work, I can tell. No, of course not. <laughs> uh, you're not inside an object right now, inside the definition of a function that you're defining in an object. Um, so you, basically, you need to pass not only what it's supposed to match, but also an execution on the thing that matches. And this execution could take several lines. It's basically a block of code, right? It's a closure. Nice. Right? You need to pass it a closure. You need to pass it some, a function, something that will take a parameter and apply something to it. And Ruby has a very like, readable way of doing this. It's, in the end, I'm going to just pass it one parameter. And the second parameter is going to be a block of stuff here. And that block of stuff here, and that's a bit of syntax that is like, hard to remember, but is very important, I'm going to call its only parameter, which is basically what was matched, like this. So like s, it's a string. And then here, I'm going to run some stuff on it. So like, for instance, uh, parenthesis plus s plus parenthesis. And that worked. This is called a block. I'm going to just reduce it so that it's on one line. That's the hardest thing I'll tell you today. And you'll see that it's really cool to use just after this. Yes? How does it know that is s a specific? No, I, it's the name I named the variable. I okay. could call it whatever. OK. And um, how does it know to match the stuff between the slashes? It so this is a regular expression. If we wanted to make it simpler, um, I didn't intend to get into regular expressions today. It's because like Rona found a way simpler way that I wanted to solve this thing. Uh, it works, right? You can no, but let's say thing. it's two characters. How does it know which one to put the parentheses around? Like, let's say we want a anything that's M-E to have uh, parentheses around it. Anything that's M or E? No, both. Two characters, oh, M-E. Uh, actually? Ah, it just matches everything in there, yeah. not just that specific. Okay. Yeah. G sub, global sub. It's like it tries to match it as many times as it can. Okay. Yes. Uh, microphone, microphone, microphone. If I have to pseudo code it, uh, how is it working? Um, so you, S is the variable that's coming from G sub? Right, exactly. So basically, if I had to read it in English, it's like, for the string, welcome to Hobbiton School, please substitute globally, G sub, everything that matches the string me, so that for each of them, do this thing. OK. If you look at the G sub documentation, you'll see actually that the Ruby documentation is really pretty cool. Oh, that's me. Uh, Ruby string, something you want to be Caring is like the version of Ruby here. 2.2.0 is recent enough. And I want to use, I want to look at substitution, so G sub. If you don't know it, you would like control F substitution, you'd probably find it very easily. G sub's here. It takes four forms. Uh, right now, I'm not going to talk about the hash one and the enumerator, enumerator one. What we use this one pattern, replacement, returns another string. And we use this one. So it's two forms of that same function that takes either two strings or a string and a block. So you can't really use blocks for every? No, 
it's because gsub expects it and you can with gsub but yeah it's everywhere where you would need to are you familiar with what a closure is yes yeah it's basically a way to have one single closure you cannot put several blocks you have only one uh, for a function uh, and just like put it in a readable way without having to like declare a closure first yeah. okay uh, anybody anybody have questions about anything so the, the documentation is pretty readable because usually you have like a really good explanation of how each form works and examples and the examples are usually like written in a way that it's easy to understand what the function does from the examples so that's really handy Speaking of closures, does Ruby support uh, closures or like multiple closures? Yes, um, that's not something that Ruby is very good at. Um, it's like in, as of verbosity, like they, basically they are verb as verbose to write as JavaScript closures, which is really like verbose and Ruby is supposed not to be too verbose. But like if you wanted to, if you wanted to write one, you would have to go like, they're called a proc. There's, like, there's another kind of closure in Ruby that's called a lambda, but like we'll go with proc for now. And it's just something like that where you pass a block. Mm. So um, a plus a space, whatever. All right, you define your, your proc. And now, uh, so let's, let's pass it into a variable. I should probably call something fancier, my proc. And then I can go my proc dot call something. I think, yeah. So you define a closure here, but like because of the blocks and because many functions that are like in a procedural language, Ruby is procedural and like uh, JavaScript, which is mostly procedural, but whatever, uh, you won't need that very often because a lot of functions will just need one. And so if it needs one, you can be sure that the block writing works. Right. So some cool stuff, oh yeah. Um, it's a question on symbols, uh, so it's going back. When when do you prefer to use symbols? Let's say I have a hash. Uh, yeah. I can define keys as a string or a symbol. Yeah, right? you will want to use symbols when you know that you're going to use those keys a lot to add, like uh, as an indexation thing rather than as data by itself. Let's say I want to build a function to ha have a class that is a sorted list. Uh, uh, a sorted okay, list, sorted so list. the okay. keys are need to be sorted, right? Uh -huh. So I, I define that hash, um, and, and when I define that hash, do you prefer the keys be a string or a symbol? It depends on your use case, but I guess a good rule of thumb is if you're going to use this, those keys in a way that you're going to actually need the data, in, like the text data in them, <coughs> then they should be strings because like, they represent data. But if you're not going to use them in that way, you should use symbols. Okay, so let's say I have a uh, hash and I want to have an implementation where I have a sorted hash, which are sorted by the keys. So in that case, my implementation is I'll grab the keys, grab the um, uh, array or hash dot keys and then sort them and return that sorted list back. Right? I, think, I think you can actually compare symbols like that. Okay. Yeah. So, so it's not a problem. It's not. So string or ha string or symbol doesn't matter. So it only matters when you when you really want to manipulate those keys later. Like they're part of the data that you need to manipulate. That's really the only thing. Like you know that it's cheaper to store them as symbols, but if you want to unwrap the symbols into strings at some point later because you need to concatenate them with something, then you probably should have stored them as strings. So this this is one of that example where I'm I'm grabbing the keys, I'm sorting them, and then I'm sending it back. So I'm I'm using the keys to do something before I return that hash. So that's why I was asking. You have a specific use case in mind that you need to solve? No, it's or, just oh, a okay. sing, sing, simple hash. Like I mean, when you say when you build a hash, it's never sorted. It just how are you putting the values in? Right? It actually is sorted in the order in which you added the stuff. Okay, so yeah. let's say after I add the stuff, I and let's say the keys are one, two, three, four, or five, six, and uh -huh. and I put them randomly, and but I want them to be sorted. So I'm grabbing okay. the keys, yeah. I'm, I'm sorting them, I have a function which will sort them, and then I return that hash. Yeah, it doesn't sound like it's anything that you need them to be strings for, okay. the keys. So if I, like by default, I always use uh, symbols for keys in hashes, because they're so much cheaper. Uh, and if I, if, if I do some data manipulation on the keys later, now I should have stored them as strings, but like, then you get the reflex pretty, pretty easily. Like, oh, I know I'm going to manipulate those things because they're, they're actual data. They're not just, you know, like, I'm not going to manipulate um, 
I'm not going to manipulate the keys here. Actually, they are strings because they're uh, parsed from JSON. But if I had created it in my code, I would probably have created them as symbols. But I guess like uh, if you wanted to sort the values based on the uh, their keys mm -hmm. and you call them like one, two, three, four, more than like going by oh yeah, yeah, yeah. And they're they're like mixed up, so it's like maybe it's five, four, three, zero, one, and you want to um, sort it from one, two, three, four, five. Wouldn't you have to like compare it to you could like convert the key into an in like a number and then so sort it by that? And then Well, I, I think my point here is that you could do that with symbols. You could sort those things if they were symbols. Uh, but actually, a good way for you probably to, to like see what I mean is that you probably will not need to do that. Because here, you have really a key, which is the ID of the task that you're looking at. It's a key. ID is not going to change. We're not going to rename it as something else. So, and we're not going to concatenate it to something else. It's the key. It's like the identifier of this information within the hash. And same here, it's the identifier of that information within the hash. If you needed to sort them, and you had stored them as symbols because in the first place you thought, this is smart to store them as symbols as much as I can, you still can, so there's no problem with that. No, uh, maybe I should rephrase my question. So I was just trying to compare the performance if you create a hash using string as keys or symbol as keys. Oh, it's going to be way more performant with symbols because they're so much more performant than strings anyway. You don't store a pointer and you don't store like a, a, an array of stuff in your stack, in your heap actually. So, so yeah. I, I, you will say that you should store keys as strings only you, when you know that you're going to manipulate them or you want them. As yeah, uh, that's really the way I do it. Like I, I would really store them as strings if I really know that I'm going to need them to be strings later. It's going to be so much more performant to have them as keys, as um, symbols. So yeah, yeah. Okay. Uh, yeah. Uh, we were before uh, at the block, and I noticed that you said that it's it could be a block of code. Uh, in this particular example, it's just a string. Uh huh. Uh, but can we put a block of code? Because in, in this case. Oh. Let's it doesn't say string, it says block on the uh, documentation. And in this case, it's a string, right? No, it's not a string. This thing is a block. It's a closure. Oh, right. So the second... Um, this is the entire, yeah, the entire element, uh, mm -mm, argument that you're passing to it. Okay. So here we have the, the two pipes with the name of the parameter we're going to use. And, and here, like, it tells you basically that your closure will have one parameter. Right, uh, but it says block instead of string. Here? Yeah. That's and because it's a block of code. You can put several stuff in there. You can go like, okay, first I want another letter, which I'm going to call T, and it's going to be S plus um, a blank space, and then I'm going to take T, and, uh, and then I'm going to do something else, whatever. It's a block of code. Okay. It, is there something we can return? Let's say we wanted to run a for loop or whatever in there. I'm going to answer this right after, I think. Can you rephrase your question so that I can try not to answer the thing that I wanted to show you? Um, <laughs> so let's okay. say we have a bunch of different variables I'm designing. I have int i, which acts as my counter. I have a for loop that loops through i. But then, guess what? Uh, like, I don't want it to be substituted with i. I want it to be substituted with something else. Uh, I want the match to be substituted by something else. Uh -huh. Like, I don't see a return statement in there. There's so none. You don't need any. This is Ruby. The last line of a block of code is the return statement. So the return is okay. that. It's the last line. Um, let's actually write this thing differently. I think it's going to be easier for you to get it. Uh, if I wanted to write this thing differently, so I created a block, right? Like the syntax is that, and I would write like a number of execution here. Actually, there's another way to uh, create a block, to write the syntax of a block. And it's a way that reads better in English. So that's why Ruby likes it. it. You can replace this thing by end, like you used to, and replace this thing by do. 
it's another syntax for exactly the same thing. So you can do like, oh, actually, you can do da 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 da. Okay. Now I want, oh, actually, ah, like this. Now I want to write like t equals s plus a blank space. And I want to write the fact that I want to return. It's going to be my last line, so it's going to return uh, this. Ah. Uh. Etc. Etc. End. So you just write it, okay? So I, I was just concerned it was going to print T or S or uh, I wasn't sure which it's one. It's all variables. Was gonna... okay. I'm just storing values into them and spitting them out. Is everybody comfortable with blocks being written with curly braces and blocks being written with do end? It's just closures, right? Like they take. One, it's functions that you carry around. Like they take one parameter in this case, because G sub expects that, and executes a number of stuff on that one parameter and return it. And so G sub takes the return statement of this, so this thing, and replaces it in the string. That's what G sub does. Okay, let's, let's, let's go a little further. Uh, we're almost done, right? Like uh, we're almost done, I promise, in the demo at least. Uh, so I had, I had this thing, right, that you saw earlier, this hash, right? Remember? This actually, it's an array that contains hashes. If you, if you remember what uh, Joe said, it's an array of three elements. Those three elements are all hashes. Uh, all those hashes actually turn out to have the symbol name as a key and another symbol that's called pets as a key. And the uh, name contains a string and the pets contains an array of strings. Okay. Right? Everybody's comfortable with this? OK, so now we're going to do some operations on this thing. Um, so for instance, uh, I want to get the, uh, which one? Oh, OK, I, I, I want to I iterate through it and just put the name of everyone. How would, I, how would I do that? How would you do that in other languages you know? So a for loop, I can go for i equals o, right? Like i equals 0, that sounds pretty familiar. I think it's that. Um, people and pets. Ah, sorry, it also completed. Um, then i plus plus set. And will I need that index later? I just want to iterate through the things, right? That sounds like a lot of work for just iterating through something. So now we're not going to do a for loop. For loops are a lot of work. You never do for loops in Ruby. Too much work. Uh, so what I'm going to do is that I want to I want to take this thing, and I want to iterate on each stuff. Like do something with each stuff. How would you write it? Each, for each. just each. In in JavaScript, the same thing exists. And it's called for each, and in some other languages, it's called for each. Here, it's just each, but it's the same thing. And what will each take, in your opinion? Each hash. Huh? So each so each will run something on that array. So we need to tell it the something, right? So how should we represent the something? You could just try to name the key. The key. Like that? Uh, dot key, no space. <laughs> like that? No. Uh, does each uh, represent the three items in the array? Each is a function that will get something done on each iteration. And get something done, usually, is a block. Right? You want to tell what to do with stuff. So you want, to, you want to write some lines of code, maybe, of what will happen with stuff. So each, I'm, I'm going to write it in the, in the short, like with the curly braces, each item, so let's call it element, because it's not an index, right? It's like the element itself. And for each element, I want to put the name. So how will I write, will I write that? So it puts. E. Yeah. So dot name will not always work in all versions of Ruby. You want to go like that, right? You just want to access the name element that matches the name symbol in that hash. Easy. Yeah. If it wasn't a symbol, you would do e dot name. Uh, so no, because the name function doesn't exist. Oh, on, function. On okay. uh, this is a this is a hash, right? Because each element of the array is a hash. And name doesn't exist on hashes. 
There are some versions of Ruby where you can do that, but I'd like you not to remember this for now, because, yeah, this is weird. So let's go back to what we we're doing. I did this. Is everybody comfortable with this? Yes. Why? Can you? Can you? Yeah. I thought this is gonna return only like the names, name like Ruby and John and Joe. Like why? an array of those things. Not an array, but why it returns uh, pets? Oh, oh, okay, okay. Sorry, okay. I should have said things more clearly. We putted the names, so they printed to the console. And I forgot to say, and thanks for asking, that each has a return uh, value, and the return value is the array that it was iterating on. So it's returning you this, but this is not part of the thing you're trying to do. Uh, you're not trying to return anything right now. We're just, you were just trying to print those things to the console. So your user is not going to see this. Your user is going to see what you return to the console. Yeah, sorry about that. Yeah. Yes. Um, so if you did inside the curly braces put like return nil, then would it clear out the... So you want to return nil here? Well, if you did the full function, but then uh, at the end of it put return nil, like so would it clear out the array? That like return nil like this? Yeah. Sure. We can just do it that way. That's fine. <laughs> like this. So return is not needed, right? So we can remove right. it. It will work with it. We will work without it. And then nothing will happen. OK, so it doesn't override the It doesn't return. change the array. It doesn't return something that changed the array into something else. It like, doesn't modify or build something new. It, like right now, I just run a block of code, which is just this, on each element. Gotcha. Now I'm going to try to do what you just said. Okay. I'm going to take this array of three elements. And for each element, I'm going to do something that will replace it and return another array of the stuff that I did on each element. This has a name in mathematics. It's called mapping. You take an array of something or a, a, a collection of something, and you map something to each of these elements. I see you have a question. Can I just finish? Yes. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, okay. Um, so let's talk people and pets. And let's apply map on it. And same thing, I want to return an array of just the names. So it's not going to print anything in the console. I want to return. I want this thing to have a return that is the array of just the names. It needs a block as well, right? We need to know what we want to be doing on each element. And on each element, I'm going to return the name. We're done. Is everybody comfortable with this? I mapped each element. So basically, OK, I took each element separately here. So, oh, oh, I should use a color. So I black on black. I took this first element here. I iterate it, right? Like when I iterate, I take elements one after the other. I took it and I replaced it by what I did here. I had a three item array before. So because I'm just replacing each stuff, I'm going to have a three item array at the end. That's a fact. But I had a three item arrays of hashes. And here I took the hash and I applied this thing to it, which made them strings, right? So I have an array of the three strings. I mapped each item of the function, of the, the array, sorry, into something else and returned the resulting array. You seem very confused. Whoa. Uh, do you, does somebody have? Sorry. Um, so when you say map, does it change the actual array, or does it create a new one? So that's one interesting thing. Right there, it didn't change the array in memory. It created another one and returned it. it. So if I look at the people and pets thing again, it didn't change. However, there's something in Ruby which is if you want to change stuff, you write the same function but with an exclamation mark. It's just a convention. I could, I could write it differently, but in Ruby, people do it like this. And this time, I changed it. Oh, 
people got it. Right. That's awesome. Yeah. Yes, you had a question. Sorry. Yes. So uh, can you it. nest um, function for for instance, if I do people and pets dot each, da 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 da, da then let's do this. Thanks for asking. So before before we do that, do you have do you, do you have questions? I'm gonna just reinitialize people and pets to what it was. Ah, oh, damn it. Where was it? All oh, right. Okay. Right. Okay. We're back to where we were. Anybody has questions about what we just saw? Um, so if you do the map thing, how do you call the new array? C do you s can you store it to a variable? So same stuff. I'm gonna. That's exactly. So basically, you could do that. You could like map it. So I'm gonna use the version that doesn't change. That doesn't mutate. It's called mutating. It doesn't mutate the initial array. Doesn't change it. Uh, and I could like store it in there, and then I have my array. But it's an array, so I can also apply stuff to it. Of course, I can go like, what's the size of this new array? Well, three. <laughs> and, uh, I like I, I, I saw like Dora through this entire presentation. Every time I was showing something that's like very Ruby, uh, like uh, magic, she was every time she was like, <sighs> this is desperating. <laughs> So I can. So let's do something very fancy, like. But, but R is at three now, right? Yeah. R is at three. Yes. Is three. R dot no, no. Oh. oh. Because yeah, I didn't change R. Sorry. Out. Yeah, you didn't. But yes, I th I think you saw me write something. Yeah. R is three. Why, why? Now it's going to be. Yes. Yeah. Okay. I hadn't affected it yet. Oh. I I just kept it. Like I just displayed it. I returned it. You didn't press enter. Yeah, I think so. Or did I? And then I reaffected it. Maybe I did. But yeah, you got it. You got it. Okay. Like uh, yeah. Okay. So I still have this thing. Now let's do something much fancier with the data manipulation. Much much fancier, and look at how like how it reads. I want the names of every person who has at least two animals. That's. I want an array. So how many elements will there be in that array? Two. Two. two, right? Because like right there, John doesn't have anything else than a goldfish. That's one animal. So I want to get Rudy and Joe. How would I do that? So there are two functions that you need to know in arrays. Two other ones. There are many functions in arrays in Ruby that allow you to do like loads of stuff. And I don't want 1.9. I want like the fancier stuff. And one of them is called select. Select will take an array, and it will only keep in the returned array the stuff that matches a condition. So we'll take this three this three item array. Like well, we're going to take use this first form here that takes a block. So we're going to go people and pets dot select, pass it a block. So on each element, I'll do something. And select expects this to be a Boolean, right? Something that's either true or false. If it's true, it's going to keep it. If it's false, it's going to kick it out. So what should I write now? Yeah? Now oh, you should take this microphone. So array dot pets dot what's, size. What's, what's array? A-R-R? -R? Oh, wait. What was There's that? nothing that was defined. Oh, people and pets, right? That people and pets is the entire array of the that, elements. Oh. What you want to do is something with one element. Test something. Oh, you are all people and pets. Sorry. Uh, so just uh, pets dot size. E is the oh, element right. that you're iterating. Okay. On, right. E For dot each element, pets. you do this thing. Right. 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 So it's not okay. dot pets. It's like this, but like you got it right. Okay. Yeah. Okay. okay. And then. Dot fancy. <laughs> <laughs> dot, dot what? Dot fancy. Dot fancy. No. It is fancy though, but no. <laughs> yeah, the one thing with programming languages, you have to write stuff that makes sense. <laughs> so what would you do? So that size now. Okay. Greater than one. Yes. And now I want to transform this array so that it doesn't return those two hashes, but only the name of each. So now I have this array. And what should I apply to it so that it transforms each element? Map. I want to map each of those elements into something else and return the the array that happens when I did. So dot map. 
Let's do the same thing on one element each time. And what do I do? E dot, oh. Yeah, <laughs> e you got dot it. name, but yeah, with the yes. brackets. So the cool thing about this is that this is part of a part of Ruby where it makes things very readable the next time that you look at it. I took the array and I only selected the ones whose pets had a size that was more than one. And then I transformed all of this into what the, their name is. So select the ones with many pets and just keep their names. It's really the way it reads. It's not exactly English language, but like if you had to iterate through it with a for loop, which is very badly regarded in Ruby, never use a for loop in Ruby, uh, you would have like something that doesn't read as much as do this, do that, do this, do that, right? So that's one of the strong things about blocks is that you can say on this thing, like do this kind of stuff. And by the way, on each element, this is what happens basically. So that's very readable. I want to get used to it, I guess, but yeah. Uh, should we do another one? Uh, I mean, it's, uh, it's so much fun. Like, we could do that all day. Could, yeah. we, huh? Okay. We could do, do like, people and pets dot each dot map. So, each. Yes. So, we each could, like, map return. something to every, every element inside each hash. So then it would become, like, we could set it all to, like, one value, like, everything inside, basically, right? If we did people and pets dot each dot map, we would be mapping stuff inside each element, right? So remember one thing is that each returns the array without changing it. It performs something on each element, like putting into the console, all this kind of stuff, but it doesn't like change what it what is returned. It returns the array as it was. So if you did that, it would work, but it wouldn't do what you're expecting it to do. It would like do something that doesn't have any impact on what's returned, and then map on that same array. Can we do it so I can see? Yeah, we can go like people and pets dot each. No, no, no. Dot each dot map. So oh, no, dot each by itself without a block yeah. doesn't return the array. It, it wants a block? It exists, but you can like take into, it returns an iterator, an enumerator, but uh, you can like, we're not going to use it enumerators, uh, so you can expect that it doesn't exist. It's not something you want to be using for now. So you want to take a block, you want it to take a block. Can you keep doing the same example you were going to do? Like, uh, puts E, uh, that's it, right? And so if you do that, you're going to get the three names and it's going to return the array. And then you can map on it, but you're just mapping on this, really. So you didn't change the array in the each statement. Each does and returns the exact same array you passed it or you called it on. But inside, can you change the array instead of printing it? Well, you can go. <coughs> and that's what you expected it to do. No, but with each, why wouldn't it work if, you, if the inside the instruction you just empty, let's say, the pets or... So each will not change the array. So you can go, you can go like this and go like e dot name instruction, if we equal nil. It. it won't do anything. It won't do anything. You're not changing anything about the array. However... Because you're working on a different array. Because you're working on... No, you're working on the same one, but it's just that each is not meant to change anything. It's just meant to execute a bunch of code without yeah, changing anything of the array. The code itself changed, changed. Can we write something? Okay, so I just wanted to do this, show you that this works, right? Mm. Why did you do that? No, that, not that map, uh, that each. Yeah, I know, I know. Here, here, like I just wanted to show something else. Like here, we returned nil, this returns nil. When you affect something to something else, like x equals 8, it returns the affected value. So here, we return nil, so we mapped every element to nil. Okay, but what if we wanted to go inside um, an array inside... Okay, if you have like a list of... If we yeah. have an array of hashes like we do, uh -huh. and then we um, inside those hashes we have arrays, which we do, and 
what if we wanted to just change the values inside the inner arrays, the arrays that are inside the hash? Change something in the hash? Yes. Yeah. It's a bit weird. Wait, I'll show you. You don't need to remember that. But yeah. basically, I'm talking about 55, but uh, line 55. But uh, 55. Go ahead. Uh, we'll finish that first, and then. Okay. So basically, you have the hash that is here. Like, uh, oh, you have uh, yeah the array, and then on each of those. Wait. On Grab each the of memory those, address. <laughs> no, 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 no. <laughs> don't do that. Uh, you you are mapping. Wait, wait, wait. You're mapping a hash. It's a, this is an array. Each array contains a hash. So now, right in there, you have a hash. Let's call it h so that it's clear. On this hash, you want to change some stuff, right? So you're going to map what's inside the hash. Except a hash doesn't have only one stuff. It has a key and a value. So you can do that on hashes. You can call map on a hash with two arguments. And then what you do is that you can go, for instance, uh, so what, what you'd want to do is have a hash here that is like that has key as a thing and v.size, for instance. I think you can actually do that. It might work. No, it's not going to work. Um, what you will want to do instead, because you can't do that, is have this be an array of two elements. And then it's a bit complicated. Like You need to be really used to Ruby to do that right. You're going to transform this array of two elements, or each of them, into a hash. And that didn't work. Uh, yes, because I wanted to do v. <laughs> Sorry, guys. Pets. Not better. So let's do it little by little. Uh, yes. So that's what I wanted. Oh, yeah, OK. Let's remove this first. Let's simplify. OK, so here I have mapped my array so that each hash is not a hash anymore. It's an array of two elements. Right? Mm -hmm. uh, except I think I transformed my people in pet array, and now it's not where it was anymore. Yeah. So yeah, let's do this again. OK. That's better. Mm -hmm. Okay. Okay. Now, what I want to do is take this thing, and instead of returning this stuff, I want this to return the size of it. For instance, right? If I do that, okay. So let me think. Um, I'm gonna do. I'm gonna do something that has. For the value. Hmm. Definitely that. It's going to return those things back into the arrays they were. And now I can. Oh, yeah. oh God. <laughs> yeah, OK. Yeah, Electra said, I don't like to come leave back something. to this later. Yeah, I'd like, I don't like to leave something unsold. But I, I'm guessing I'm going to have to. Like, what's V here? Oh, uh, OK. Uh, OK, let's, let's solve this later. But basically, transforming a hash, you will have to like, transform it into an array, because a hash only maps into an array, and then make it be a hash again. This is very costly in memory, by the way. So this is something like, that you know will cost. Yeah, so uh, on line 55, uh, is there a way we could? <laughs> Sorry. Uh, I think it was the each thing, right? This thing? Yeah. Um, each doesn't by itself does not change the array. I get that. But what if our code inside the each so, changed it? Yes. Yeah, so in this case, it does because the code instead of it does. Exactly. That's so so we could use each as a map if we really, really, really wanted to. Just I mean, just so we can understand. Yeah, that. a map that mutates. The say that again. It, it mutated it, right? Like it changed it. It changed it the original changes array. It. So a map uh, map um, exclamation mark. Right. Right? Uh, but it's really not beautiful. <laughs> it's, uh, right, yeah. right. But to know that we can do it sort of like 
integrates with my understanding and makes yeah. it good, okay. mutualizes it, I guess. Let's get back to what it was. OK, we're almost done. Uh, does anybody else have a question about anything? Yes? Uh, just a representation of uh, the way you do e. Why, why can't we you do e dot name? So you have to do a square bracket and then the colon. Because it, it's not the way it works in Ruby. It's just a syntactic thing. Uh, I had a quick question. Just um, hopefully this is quick uh, about like uh, accessing the the pets elements. Like if you it, before when you demonstrated map to get the um, the three names. Uh -huh. Like would there be a way with that in that same line to actually return the um, the four pets? So you can. So y your your question was. So we had this thing a while back. That were the, the yeah the two names yeah and right. then if like how would you then actually return the the two pets of Rudy and Joe as opposed to the name like that oh sorry I didn't yeah I replaced I'm gonna just make it smaller so it's more it fits on one line I re I didn't want its name I mapped it into its pets okay yeah and actually let's make it even cooler I have a two level array right I'm gonna make it bigger. I want to have everything on the same level. That's called flatten. Right? Now I have a one level array. Uh, and now that I, want, I have a one level array, I want to display it as a string separated by commas and a space. It's like you can do all those things that are like very convenient with arrays in Ruby as well. And that don't, like it doesn't necessarily need a block. Like I know how to flatten an array without needing to know what I need to do on each element or whatever. Uh, but yeah, all those things are. So like that's one of the strengths of Ruby. Um, if you like, Python and Ruby are very similar, but this is one of the differences. Like Ruby has a very rich um, API to manipulate collections, and uh, Python's API is like very decent, but a, a lot less fancy with loads of stuff, basically. All right, let's move on. <laughs> okay, um, so we said no for loop. Okay. Um, now I want to put hello, but I don't want to put it once. I want to put it a hundred times. How would I do that, ideally? Okay. Like that? Ah, damn it! <laughs> Outside the string. So I want to loop over. Like right now, I'm doing only puts, but I want to loop over a block of stuff. So actually, this is a block of stuff. So let's let's make it be a block of stuff. So it's probably going to be passed to a function here. Uh, and I want this thing to happen 100 times. How would I write it? Wait, I have a question. Uh -huh. Couldn't you do, just do 100 times hello outside of? Could you do puts 100 times open quotes? Like that? Times. Like that. So it's trying to multiply an integer and a string. Not Why can't happy. we do that? <laughs> Because you want it to be more readable than this. Okay. This is not very, very readable. So you could put puts hello dot times and then in parentheses 100, maybe? So more readable than this. I mean, or you could just do hello times 100 like in Python, but like I was wondering if there's such a thing as like a times method. A what? Times method. So, so there hello is dot times, times method. And then in parentheses 100. And you would just actually more readable a hundred times oh uh, okay yeah a hundred dot sure. times block and if you want to read it more because like you have more stuff to make it do of course you could do as usual do puts hello do a bunch of other stuff whatever whatever right you had a c thing recently actually where you had to put like a an integer Wait, you have to put like two integers to together and the first one had to be smaller than the second, like 0, 0, 0, 1, 0, 2, 0, 3. In Ruby, I'm not sure I can do it. <laughs> but uh, uh, you can store the index, actually. You can take the index. Uh, you had like two for loops inside of each other. It should be like that. And I wanted to print into the console. Uh, And I wanted it to print it only if 
i was smaller than j. That's greater. Ah, damn it. Uh, yeah, it just needs to be strings here. So two strings. What is it? You want it to be smaller, not greater, right? Smaller, you're right. And not equal, right? If they were equal, you, you, didn't, you had not to print them, right? I don't remember. Huh? You might be unique, so. Yeah, okay. Okay? Done. Okay. So let's go back to the statement, because it's very... <laughs> right. If I were to write this in a program, I would put it on several lines. Like, this is a one-liner, but this is a bit abusive to put it as a, a one-liner, right? Like, I would have, like, 100 times do and uh, end, 100 times do, end. Or, or more, more to the point, 100 times do, 100 times do, and end. Okay. Yeah. Can you read the SF just to get a better sense of... No problem. In English? Yeah. Okay. So please, Ruby interpreter, a hundred times, do this thing with an index i, which will go from 0 to 99. So this thing. A hundred times, do this thing with an index j. Only print it, them together, if i is smaller than j. What is i set to increase? It increases because it is the index that increases in this block. This is how times work. Oh. Yeah. Yeah, that's just a, a feature of times. And it's, it's uh, optional. If you don't put it because you don't need it, you can like remove this. Here, I needed it here, so like, that's why I, I took it. I didn't, I didn't use it when I put hello 100 times because I didn't need it. OK? I think we're done with everything I wanted to show you hands-on. So I just have a few closing remarks, if you're, if you're good. Uh, so do you have any question before we move to the few closing remarks? Um. What time is it? Oh, god damn it. How, do, how works uh, concurrency? Uh. <laughs> You'll see that in the project, in okay. the optional parts. Uh, Ruby, as it said in the project, is not a language that's uh, strong with concurrency. So it's strong in the way that it does what everything else, like uh, other languages do, because every language, every language do that. But they either do it in like a, a very concise and readable and efficient way or not. And Ruby, it's not one of its strong suits. It does, but it's not concise to write. Well, there are worse languages as of concurrency, but like compared to Go, for instance, which is like a language built for concurrency, um, yeah. No, compared to Python, is it the same? Uh Python is roughly the same. Uh, I think a little bit, little bit shorter, but it's also not its point, right? It, like there are two scripting languages; they're not really built for that. So yeah. Okay, moving on to the to the few remarks. Uh, OK, so blocks, magic. Some stuff we didn't cover. Objects, but they're easy in Ruby. Uh, it's just like uh, you need to know what objects are. So we'll actually go over that later uh, during the curriculum for the, the students. Uh, but once you know what objects are, like the syntax of objects is very trivial. IO, writing to a file, reading from a file, uh, getting from a web service, whatever, whatever, very easy. Uh, closures, I actually showed you. They're OK. They're not easy, easy, but they're decent. And of course, there's a lot more. Like one of the one of the nice parts of Ruby is that it comes with a lot of features. Style guide, really quickly. Uh, so style guide, like it's uh, things that like when you write Ruby code, like there are conventions. So they they're not enforced by Ruby. It's just the way that Ruby developers write stuff. Variables are written with underscore, right? If you have several words in a variable, you write underscores in them, not camel case, so not like a capital letter for each word. However, types are written with capitalized camel case. So like the first letter is capitalized and the rest of it is camel case. Good to remember. It's all conventions, right? Like it doesn't make more sense than anything, but you know. You can create a function name so that they favor readability like a sentence. If you can, if it's something that like makes sense in the way your API is designed, try to. People will expect you to. So you can write two dot days dot ago to say two days ago and get the dates of two days ago. We saw that. If you want to test the type of something, you can go, x is a hash. You know, like this is very readable. And it, as much as you can, which will not always be possible, you should try to make it read like English. 
no parenthesis when defining and calling functions with no parameter. So we've seen that they are optional when you have parameters. They're also optional when you don't have parameters. So they look like, you know, like an attribute of that object or whatever. Like they don't look like a function. In Ruby, you will never use those parentheses. The compiler, the, the interpreter, will let you put them, but people will expect that you don't. So by default, don't. We talked about that. If you want a function to mutate something that you applied on, which means you will change it, you want to add an exclamation mark at the end of it, just so that the user, when they use it, know that they're messing something up, and that they shouldn't expect that after this function, everything will be the same, basically. And another cool one is that, we've just seen it here actually, when a function returns a boolean, so that it's readable, you will actually write the sentence in an affirmative way. So like you don't say, uh, does it return a boolean? No, you write returns a boolean, like is a, and you will end it with a question mark. And that way the question mark's not at the end of the sentence because it belongs to the function and what, what, it, what its type is, so you couldn't put it at the end of the sentence. But it does read like visually a lot more like a sentence. Right. Uh, can you go over the, the, the mutate something one? So array.map, the one we used before, uh, returned a new array that was created from scratch with some different stuff, but that variable didn't change. Oh. And here, the developer did on purpose to add a quite an exclamation mark to attract your attention on the fact that array will change. So when you apply a function that mutates the thing that it's applied on, uh, like developer will ensure that they use an exclamation mark to attract your attention on it. Okay, so mutate something is, oh, do we want that or no? When, when your function mutates something, put an exclamation mark. It's not enforced by the Ruby interpreter, you could forget to do it, but developers will, will, who will use your code will expect you to do that. And so that when you use their code or when you use the Ruby uh, core code, uh, it's always like that. When you see a question mark, make sure that like you really want to modify the thing that you're modifying, destroy some stuff. But isn't that an instruction to the Ruby? What? What is? Oh, sorry. Yeah, the there's one here. Oh. Isn't that an instruction to the Ruby interpreter? Actually, absolutely not. Actually, you could call that function with map underscore and underscore mutate, for instance, and not put a, uh, an exclamation mark. It would compile. It would work. But by convention, people don't do that. By convention, people write an exclamation mark to say something is going to mutate. But if you don't write the exclamation mark, it doesn't mutate. It doesn't change it. Like, it does. It always does with the map. No, it, oh, so, OK. When you define it or when you use it? When you either, I guess. When you define it, it's your responsibility to put an exclamation mark at the end when you want the user to like, pay attention to the fact that they will mutate something. When you use it and you see it, it gives you the information that the developer tried to attract your attention on it, that it will mutate something. So it's just a convention. It's just a convention. Yeah, the exclamation mark is not an operator. It's a convention. So when the people wrote the maps function, they wrote two functions, one without the exclamation mark and one with. With the exclamation mark, they made sure that the return value is the changed array. And then for the function without the exclamation mark, they just made it return whatever the original array was. That's correct. That it's sense. two different functions. One that has like four characters to call it, and one that has three. Oh, yeah. it's two different functions. It's two different functions. <laughs> okay. Yeah. Sometimes you have the one with the exclamation mark that is created by the developers and not the other one. You know, like, it's just two different functions. Oh, so when we create a function, we should... Exactly. Got it. By convention, when it. you create a function and you know that it's going to change this, the thing that it's called on, add an exclamation mark at the end. And the same here. It's part of the name of the function. Add an ex uh, question mark at the end. Yeah. Yeah. Thanks. Job market. Actually, job market in Ruby, uh, and I mean, it applies to Python as well. Really good. Um, yeah, pretty good. Everybody's uh, like, who doesn't know this reference? Curb your Curb enthusiasm. enthusiasm. Yeah, it's a TV show, whatever. Uh, yeah, it's, it's actually one of the, uh, if you work in the Bay Area, because it's not true everywhere, uh, it's actually one of the strong points of Ruby and Python. Uh, loads of jobs and uh, like very high activity. Uh, something worth noting, in the Bay Area and most of the world, it is not the case in France and in Israel, for instance, where like, there's barely any Ruby market. It's strange, it's just like different cultures uh, made this happen. It's the same with Python, actually. France and Israel don't have much Python for some reason. So they have a lot of PHP, they have a lot of Java. 
Uh, here, it was the case, PHP and Java were very present 15 years ago, something like that. And uh, Java is still very present in some cases, uh, like uh, banking and like big systems, uh, where Ruby, like Ruby is not performant, Python is not very performant either, uh, both kind of equal, so like they don't really match this kind of needs. So Java is still used for that case. Uh, but now that there's Go, maybe that will change actually. Anyway, that's another topic. And there's a huge demand, uh, which explains why when you look at boot camps, like they're all doing Ruby. Uh, they're actually not even doing Python, which is very surprising because there's a, a lot of demand in Python as well. Uh, but yeah, like, so there's like, there are like a lot of jobs in Ruby in the Bay Area. Um, it is mature uh, because Ruby has actually risen to like this amount of notoriety very quickly. I think I, I told you that earlier. Uh, and so it's been over 15 years that it's like uh, the, one of the leading, at least now I think it's the leading market in the Bay Area, but like uh, it became a leading market very quickly. And so now you have like a lot of different jobs, like you have a lot of junior jobs, a lot of intermediate jobs, a lot of senior jobs. Uh, it's very mature that way. For instance, like if we compare it to Go, um, from the researches I've started to do, Go looks a lot less mature. Like there's a lot, it's very recent, right? Like Go is a very recent technology, so it could like grow like crazy, but we're not really there yet. Uh, and there are a lot of, of senior jobs and junior jobs are harder to get by from the um, uh, boards I went to. But then again, maybe that means that employers don't expect people who graduate from a school to no go. So that's probably also why. So like basically we're at, we're at a point where like um, uh, at least Ruby and Python are very mature. Um, and are, like jobs are like reported. Uh, it's very large, a lot of demand in the Bay Area. I seriously have yet to hear of a company that doesn't use Ruby and or Python for something. So they are like really that large. Um, Facebook. Huh? Facebook. Yeah, but they're like, yes, I do have a friend who works for Facebook and actually uses Ruby for internal tools. The Facebook product is the only product in the Bay Area built with PHP, uh, only like massive at least. Uh, so it's a long story, but basically the strategy with, which actually really paid off really well was that PHP is the most used language on the net, on the web. Why? Because it's a really nice gateway language. Uh, people need a blog, they install WordPress. WordPress is built into PHP, or they install Drupal, Easy Publish, this kind of stuff. It's all built in PHP. And then they get to the point where they need to modify the footer, they need to modify the header, whatever. So they need to learn some PHP. So you get a lot of very good quality programmers all throughout the United States and everywhere that got into programming, or at least web programming with PHP. And Facebook noticed that. And Facebook noticed that nobody was hiring them. And so they were like, what the hell? They are very good. It's not because just they didn't study another language that it's not promising. So they betted a lot on PHP. And they're not doing PHP anymore, they're doing Hack, which is like a, um, a language that's um, forked from PHP. Uh, it's PHP with, with types and without the uh, performance and safe stuff, like eval and stuff like that. So like PHP with less stuff and more typing. Uh, and this language, instead of being interpreted like PHP is, like Ruby is, like Python is, is actually JIT compiled to. It runs on something that's called HHVM, which is a VM. Um, and so Ruby like released that project it's open source. Like you can use Hack on HHVM, which is like a, a compiled version of PHP a bit modified. And so they're the only ones who use it, Hack and HHVM. Uh, like no one else has used them because it's really dedicated to Facebook's need. Uh, but yes, Facebook like has a job pool that no other big company in the Bay Area has, and that worked. Now they're recruiting many people from everywhere when Google and, uh, and Apple and et cetera mostly recruit people who come from the same kind of culture than the Bay Area. So Ruby, Python, this kind of stuff. It's pretty smart. It worked out. I mean, like, it, it wasn't obvious at first that it would work. It did. So yeah. OK. Uh, lucrative, actually. Uh, and I think it's the same with Python. Uh, like this one article that I sourced here, I'm going to put the slides um, online after that. Uh, like talks about Ruby and puts it with like the data scientists and machine learning engineers. So the people who like, I'm talking about not junior ones, right? I'm talking about intermediate or senior uh, Rails developers because they are Ruby developers because there's so much demand. Uh, like there's some good money to do <laughs> basically. Um, and still growing unlike most modern languages. So it's a very interesting thing, but it's very recent. So you shouldn't take it as something important. Python is actually uh, decreasing. Uh, but Python is so big that, you know, <laughs> it's decreasing, but it's not like scary at all. Uh, Ruby is actually still growing. 
uh, which is very surprising after 15 years and like such a, an early head start, but it is. So that's pretty interesting. All right, so what is Ruby good and bad for? So what is Ruby not good for? Uh, what would you, yeah, what would you say? Concurrent. So concurrency, yes, I didn't actually list it, uh, but yes, that is true, it's not, it's not good for it. It works well, but it's not good for it. But in a, more, in a more general way, something that will never really work well with Ruby is performance, right? We decided that it would be a developer happiness oriented language, not a performant language that enforces a lot of rules. So of course you're gonna waste a lot of performance. Uh, so focused on developer happiness before anything else, definitely performance trade-off. And actually that could actually make you wonder something, uh, which is also something very important to understand why uh, Python and Ruby got so popular, is that that means that in the 2000s, people didn't want performance anymore. You know, like all of the languages before that were like very performance inclined. And all of a sudden those two ones got created roughly at the same time and like became widely popular all at once. So what happened? What happened is that, what, what we would expect, like there was a lot of performance, uh, like people, basically performance was a key value of programming for decades. And what happened in the 2000s is that uh, companies starting to notice that sometimes they didn't need performance as much, that performance had been a little bit overrated, and sometimes they do, and started to make a difference. Like, oh, oh actually, if I want to be scripting something, should I, like it's something that I'm gonna run once and it's gonna take 30 seconds to run and it's gonna take me, uh, if I'm writing it, like for instance, C is not a very good scripting language, for instance. If I write it with C, it's gonna take me two hours because I know C well. If I write it with something simpler, maybe it's gonna take me 15 minutes. So, uh, and it's gonna be much slower. Uh, it's gonna be much slower. But on the other hand, I'm gonna run it only once and it's gonna only run for 30 seconds. So should I really bother about this? And so people started to like, uh, accept those non-performant languages more and more, uh, but reserving them for, for like some use cases where they were not, like non-performance was not as bad. And then what happened in the industry, which made it grow all at once, is that people realized at some point that the places of the industry where they really needed very raw performance were actually not as many as they thought. And so like those languages kind of like ate the industry a lot. Not all of it, uh, definitely performing languages are still gonna be needed for a lot of stuff like embedded stuff and, not, and all, but that's why they ate stuff. And what I feel is very interesting about Go is that if you identify these things as like two ages of like um, develop of programming languages, there were like some previous ones, but like let's focus on these ones, like the performance age and the like, uh, let's, let's use something that's not performant, but like more productive age, Go, could be a third age. And that's very exciting, I think. That's what I find very exciting about Go. It is very performant. Yeah, I know, I know, but it's, it's very performant. And at the same time, it provides a lot of productivity tools. And that I never seen a language before that was performant and productive. It's not as productive as Ruby, but it's not as performant for most uh, projects as C, of course. But it's a really good like a trade, like middle, yeah. How does it compare with Scala or Alexi? Uh, so, well, actually, how does it compare with Scala and? Alexi? So Alexi, I don't know. I've never used it. Scala, um, very performant to run, somewhat performant to run, uh, very non-performant to compile. Uh, like when you compile a, a Scala language, it might take 10 seconds, 15 seconds, it's a big Java a Scala program. Uh, Go really compiles like that. And something that's very interesting too is that Go compiles or interprets. You don't even need to compile Go to use it. So like it's, this is one of the features that make it more productive. You don't even have to compile it to use it. Um, Go has way less features than Scala. Uh, Scala comes with like functional programming out of the box, uh, comes with uh, objects. Go doesn't have objects because they cost a pointer. Uh, like this kind of stuff. So like it, it is a lot more resource aware than Scala. Uh, it compiles faster, but it embeds a lot less stuff, basically. Okay, uh, so basically Ruby was good when it was uh, out and is and grew even better where it turned out that performance had been overrated. So for instance, any scripting or almost any scripting, like an employer will not want you to like spend two hours on the script that will run only 30 seconds. You know, like they will want you to make that script, get it to run and move on to something else. 
And so like this is this is actually more of a reason why Python was created actually for scripting. Like the um, uh, what's his name, uh, Guido van Rossum, when he created Python, looked at C and looked at Bash, and he said there's got to be a middle. You know, and that's how he came up with Python. Uh, and web backends. Why? That is strange, right? Why would people massively use Python and Ruby for web backends? Because it turns out that and we'll see that very often, uh, very soon in, the, in one of the front-end projects, that roughly 80 to 90% of a web request is spent in the browser, in the front-end. So actually, the, the, and it makes sense when you think about it, like you can control how your back-end code is run, you cannot control how the front-end code is run in the browser. You have to make it like, compatible with some standards that are very verbose, et cetera. So it takes a lot of time, you have to load all those images, you have to do all those things. So it turned out that actually, the raw performance in the back end was not as needed as people thought, except for some very precise cases, Google search, Twitter, you know, like those things cannot live without like a lot of raw performance, but that's very, very specific cases. And at some point, Ruby didn't scale. It was scaling meaning uh, like you, you wanted it to support more users. Uh, you would create a new server that's complicated and like they wouldn't talk together so well. Uh, they like it would happen very soon in, because Ruby was not as performant as it is today. It's much better now. Now, actually, it is much better. So like you get a lot of very strong players whose main product, the public product, actually is made in Ruby. Uh, GitHub, Airbnb, SlideShare, et cetera, are all made in Ruby, for instance. If this list was about Python, you would, you would have an interesting list as well. So it's like very similar in that way. Yep. Uh, yeah, the 80 90%, does that mean we're adding 10% uh, or does uh, or do they do the back end and the front end run at the same so time? So that means you do, uh, we'll go over that soon more in detail and you'll know all the details of that. But basically, you're a user, you click on that link to load a page, the HTTP request is going to go all the way through the internet. Then you reach your server, now you start counting. It does some stuff, it responds, stop counting. And you respond, and you write back to your user, everything loads, everything runs in the JavaScript code, etc. When you start, started and stopped counting, that was 10% of the whole time of what I just did. So it does add 10%? It does add 10%, yes. Okay. But now that you have like caching and this kind of stuff where you can cheat on, it doesn't even need to run the Ruby code to actually return something. Uh, it's so easy to, and actually I tell you, hobbitonschool.com and the intranet don't even have caching. 10% um, yeah. is not bad, I guess. Yeah. And I mean, that's the same with like basically all of the backend languages, because at some point something needs to happen over there bef because it, before it's returned. So it doesn't make a huge difference, is basically the point. And actually, there are some performance intensive use cases where Ruby makes sense, but they're very rare. So it exists, it's exciting, it's cool to know, but uh, most likely you wouldn't. Why? Because for instance, threading, concurrency, uh, as of writing the language, it's not practical. But if you use JRuby, for instance, which is one of the implementations, it's really good at threading as of performance. So, like, your mileage may vary. Uh, overall, however, Ruby is not good as most performance intensive use cases, right? It happens that it is, but it's really rare. Uh, so, system programming, like writing an OS, writing drivers, you would do it in C. Uh, firmware, embedded systems, writing stuff for the Raspberry Pi, for Arduino, for like anything like that, don't do that with Ruby. You would do that with C++ and now more and more Go, but we're nowhere near Go is like, uh, like you know, big enough where you'd say it's going to replace C++, no one knows. Except there's one thing that is interesting, and here too, like we're talking uh, uh, state of the art, it's nowhere near being something that's really used in the industry, it's MRuby. And MRuby is very interesting, the guy who created Ruby is now working on MRuby. And MRuby is Ruby without the non-performance stuff and compiled so that it runs very quickly. So it's basically a subset of Ruby for lower level programming. Uh, nowhere near usable, uh, but they published a benchmark last month or the month before and I was like, oh, getting somewhere, you know? Doesn't mean they will conquer the industry. Like there are a lot of more steps to get there, but it's interesting, like they're working on this, who knows what's gonna happen, yeah. Uh, could you talk about the situation with like Rails as far as looking for Rails jobs versus Ruby? Yeah, so most Ruby jobs are in Rails or at least in web. Like Ruby is more and more a language that's used for web rather than uh, 
because like it's used for scripting, but that's you don't make a full job with just some scripting. <laughs> so uh, so yes, it used Rails is a framework, a web framework for Ruby. It is the most used web framework for Ruby. Actually, here's some interesting information that you will definitely that uh, will give you some interesting insights. Usually, there are two flavors of web frameworks. Uh, minimal ones, which are called micro frameworks. What micro frameworks do is they will match a route that is called, like uh, the, the URL, and decide what is the code that should be run. And they do a number of other stuff, but it's like not, re not really that much more. Or full fledged frameworks, like big stuff, that will uh, embed an internalization engine, embed like caching strategies, embed like loads of stuff. Loads, loads, loads of stuff. Rails is the big one. Uh, in Ruby, uh, the most popular micro framework is Sinatra. Mm -hmm. And usually you would have those two kinds of frameworks in every technology. Django in Python, um, Flask. Uh, in JavaScript, Express.js and Nodal kind of, but it's not really uh, mainstream yet. Maybe it could be. Uh, Nodal, or like there's, there are some others. It's not nuclear winner really on the big ones. Um, in Java, Spark, um, a lot of them <laughs> are big ones, like uh, struts, for instance. Uh, so like every technology kind of like has that, like the micro framework and the big one. Rails is the most popular framework for Ruby, which is not a performant language. So not surprisingly, that's the big one. You know? Yeah, it just feels like I've heard that you know, if you're a Rails developer, then you're kind of stuck. As they want you to like stay a Rails developer. Like it's really hard to like cross over to a. So it's really hard to do any Rails without knowing all of Ruby. So uh, it's not really like jQuery and JavaScript, for instance. Like you can do some jQuery and never understand how JavaScript works. Uh, Ruby is very different in the way that Rails gives you tools to do better stuff, but you still need to use all of Ruby. Um, but yeah, definitely, if your interest is in scripting some Ruby stuff, I don't think there would be like many jobs that only has that, you know? So usually they, it will go with something else. And if, for instance, it, it would be like some uh, hardware closed stuff, like lower level stuff, you wouldn't use Ruby for that. So usually it will be web jobs. That's why. Python is the same. You will have like scripting stuff in your jobs, but they won't really make for a full job. Uh, but it will be mostly like web uh, backend jobs or full stack. Yeah. So um, I was asking my brother his thoughts on Ruby and he said some stuff I didn't really understand but he mentioned like model view controller and he said that like if you use Ruby on Rails you'll end up like having a lot of stuff you don't actually need for your MVC. That's true. Um, and that so yeah like, like I said like for each technology you have a micro framework and uh, like a leading one and a leading one, a leading framework that's big. Rails comes with everything you don't need. So that in case you need it, it's there. So that is true. So the MVC bit of it is probably what is like the rawest thing in a micro framework, right? Like it will provide you with like a way to call controllers. You can add a templating engine for the views. We'll go over what MVC is another day. Like this is a wide topic. Uh, Rails does MVC as well, but also comes with like tons of other stuff that you might want to be using. So couldn't they just use Sinatra and that would eliminate the issue? Yeah, except uh, I don't want to be writing an internalization, an internalization engine every time I make a website or a caching strategy every time I make a website. This is how you would do in JavaScript, though. Like uh, Usually, you would use Express.js and add libraries that do those kind of stuff. And you can do that with Ruby, too. But uh, most people don't do that with Ruby because it's already not a very performant language anyway. So like the overhead you're getting from Rails uh, is, is big. But it won't like you won't you didn't need that website to be a can you hear me? One one? Maybe you ran out of batteries. You didn't need that website to serve millions of uh, queries per second anyway. That's why you used Ruby. Because you're not Google search, basically. I think it's a battery thing. No? Oh well. Yep. That's true. Whatever. It's fine. We're almost done anyway. Huh? <laughs> okay. <laughs> it should. It should shut me off. <laughs> Any other question about anything? I think we're almost done. I think. I hope. Yeah, we're done. So it was in the opening screen. I don't know if you noticed it. It's a. It's a quote by Matt saying that we need to focus on the human rather than the, on the machines because we are the masters and they are the slaves. Anyway, I think it's pretty cool, and that defines a lot of the this philosophy behind the language. All right. Does anybody have extra questions that others could benefit for, from? Because I'm going to be here anyway, for the rest of the morning at least. Oh, well. <laughs> so, 
So we'll talk about that when we talk about object-oriented stuff. Uh, but Ruby has a very interesting way to do that. So gems are libraries for Ruby, basically. That's the way Ruby calls their libraries. And you have um, a tool that's called Ruby Gem that uh, is installed. Usually when you install Ruby, it installs Ruby Gem with it. The same way NPM, remember NPM for JavaScript, for Node.js, it's the same stuff. You run like gem install the name of the library and it will find it for you and make it put it on your computer and it will download all the dependencies for you so you don't have to worry about that and put them on your computer. Yeah. What is it? So bundle is bundler is actually a dependency manager. So okay. So we're yeah, it's like don't 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 worry if you don't remember that. Uh, bundler will basically allow you to write a file that's called a gem file and you will list all of the libraries that you need for your particular project and then you call bundle install and we'll run gem install on each of them so that you get them all at once basically you have that in basically every technology like npm comes with package.json if you create that file then it will like fetch all of the things that are in that json file uh, uh, php has one uh, it's been not long but they do it's called composer and it does the same thing like there's a file that it looks for and it's going to download all the stuff yeah it's not amazingly unique like uh, every technology has one Are we good? Sorry, this lasted much longer than it should have. Uh, this was fun, though. <laughs> I hope you liked it. Thank you very much.